I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 2nd, 2016. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Karen Steele, Principal, Principal, George Washington Carver, Car Carver Center for the Arts and Technology, and Joe Gyra, Principal, Hereford High School. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served <coughs> education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first agenda item is a consideration of the agenda for tonight. Uh, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Yes, Mr. Chair. Under New Business Act, a report on Southwest Area Elementary School Boundary Study Recommendation, I would like to add action taken in closed session to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Uh, in accordance with the Board of Education Policy 8314, additional items can be added to the agenda by unanimous consent of the board members present. All in favor of adding agenda action item taken in closed session to tonight's agenda signify by a show of hands. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I have a, an agenda change request as well. Oh, we have to vote on Do it separately. Separately. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, all in favor of adding action taken in closed session to tonight's agenda signify by a show of hands. All opposed? Okay. So the uh, agenda will uh, be changed uh, as corrected. Uh, Ms. Miller? Yes, I ask that the agenda be reordered so that the stakeholder and public comments come before consideration of the reappointment of the superintendent. All right, that uh, motion, is there a second? All right. Uh, second. Okay, all, all in favor of ch rearranging the uh, agenda, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay, we'll, the agenda will remain the same. Thank you. <coughs> Our next uh, item is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first speaker is David Green. Second speaker has no first name, just White. Third speaker is Kaya Johnson. Number four is Marion Moore. Number five is Sarah Rosen. Number six, Beverly Grace. Number seven, Chris Zack. Number eight, Kevin Hill. Mm -hmm. Number nine, Mary Duvall. Number 10, Linda Spiral, S P R I U L L. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. All right, our uh, next agenda item is a special order of business, consideration of the reappointment of the superintendent. At this time, I'll call on Mr. Yolfelder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the following uh, resolution. The term of the superintendent of schools for Baltimore County, S. Dallas Dance, 
PhD expires by law on June 30th, 2016. And whereas Mr. Dr. Dance has communicated to the board that he is a candidate for reappointment as superintendent of schools, and whereas the board has reviewed performance materials deliberated over the course of time regarding Dr. Dance's reappointment, and whereas the board has heard from the public regarding Dr. Dance's reappointment in writing at board meetings and at a public hearing, be resolved that the Board of Education hereby appoints S. Dallas Dance, Ph.D., as the superintendent of schools for a four-year term of office effective July 1, 2016, subject to the Board of Education and Dr. Dance entering into a mutually agreeable contract and further subject to the statutory mandated approval of the state superintendent of schools. All right, there's been a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Gets a motion. Is there any discussion at this time? Okay, as, as many as are in favor of the reappointment of Dr. S. Dallas Dance, as your name is called, answer aye or yes. Those opposed will answer nay or no. And those who wish not to vote will answer abstain. Please call the roll. Ms. Cozy? No. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Miller? No. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Yulefelder? Yes. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. <coughs> yes. Mr. McDaniel. Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, there's a very important reason why I need to know what the uh, number was. <laughs> Ten to two. Ten to two. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Sir. All right. Um, our next uh, order of business is consideration of the superintendent's contract. Since the board has voted to reappoint Dr. Dance to another four-year term, do I have a motion to authorize commencing contract negotiations with Dr. Dance? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Okay, uh, please call the roll. Mr. Posse? No. Mr. Collins? I wasn't paying attention. I don't know what this is <laughs> votes for. <laughs> Commence contract negotiations. Commencing contract negotiations with Dr. Dance. Let me think about it. <laughs> yes. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Yulefelder? Yes. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Mr. McDaniel? Yes. All right, the motion carries. Thank you very much. By what number? By what number? I need to say that for the public. 11 1. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving through our agenda, um, we have a special order of business where we're recognizing former board members, and this is uh, one of the pleasures of uh, having these board members. So um, I would ask at this point for uh, Mr. Parker for, to come up first, um, and uh, then Mr. George Marniotis will come up afterwards. <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, it really, it truly is a pleasure to welcome back Mr. Ed Parker, who is a board member when I first came on and was a mentor to me and really encouraged me in all my participation on the board. And I would just ask, I know you have some family here, but uh, could you introduce your family that's with you tonight, Mr. Parker? Well, I have my lovely wife, Fran. Hey. <laughs> I have my son, Michael Parker, who is also a principal. <laughs> I'm here representing myself. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Parker. And it's with great pleasure I present this resolution to you. It reads, uh, whereas H. Edward Parker has served as a member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with distinction and honor from July 2006 through June 2015, and he has provided exemplary service to the students, parents, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools as Vice President of the Board for four consecutive years, 2007, 8, 9, and, two, and 2010. <coughs> and whereas Mr. Parker has worked actively for the achievement of all Baltimore County students with focus on raising the bar and eliminating achievement gaps, and he has served on the following Board of Education committees. Audit Committee, where he served as Chair, member of the Building and Contracts and Curriculum Committees, and Vice Chair of the Policy Review Committee. And whereas he also served on the Maryland Association of Boards of Education Insurance Committee, and Mr. Parker did represent the board on ethics, on the ethics review panel, and whereas he always placed the needs of all students <laughs> as his first priority, and whereas Mr. Parker has committed his time and expertise to the Baltimore County Public Schools community now, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County herewith assembled in regular se session on the second day of February in the year two th 2016 recognizes the outstanding contributions of H. Edward Parker and be it further resolved that the board does herewith extend its deepest appreciation and gratitude for his dedication, loyalty, and service and further extends its best wishes for good health, happiness, and continued success in future endeavors. Thank you so much, Mr. Parker. Great you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the resolution. However, I believe, unless you misread it, that he served until December of 2015. I thought you said July. Oh, maybe uh, George was until December. Yeah. No, it was ah. no, Ed was here until December no, also. No, no, no. <laughs> well, there was somebody sitting. It is correct. <laughs> there was somebody sitting in this seat that looked just like him. <laughs> Uh, I second the motion. Heart. But anyway. Second. I second, second the motion, please. Uh, 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 all in favor, please say uh, aye. Uh, aye. Thank you. This, this is a great honor, and I, I want to thank you all for, for doing this. Um, it, it's very humbling to, to stand here and have your service recognized. And I want to thank Governor Ehrlich and Governor O'Malley for giving me the appointment to be able to serve the citizens and the students of Baltimore County. It has been my privilege and my honor to have been able to serve the people of Baltimore County. Thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to call up Mr. George Maniotis. Yeah. Mr. Monty Otis was also a mentor to me uh, as I began on the board a few years back. And um, as the board uh, attempts to um, reach out to the community and understand the needs uh, of, of our parents and others in the system, Mr. Monty Otis is very connected to our communities all around Baltimore County and has been a unique resource in trying to reach out to the community and understand what the public uh, needs in our, in our school system and education system. So it's with great pleasure that I uh, present this resolution to Mr. George Monty Otis. Uh, whereas George Monty Otis has served as a member of the board 
Board of Education of Baltimore County with distinction and honor from July 2010 through December 2015. And whereas he has provided exemplary service to the students, parents, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools, and Mr. Marnie Otis has worked actively for the achievement of all Baltimore County students with focus on raising the bar and eliminating achievement gaps. And whereas he has served on the following Board of Education committees, Building and Contracts Committee, where he not only served as a member, but was chair and vice chair, and the Government Relations Committee, and whereas Mr. Armani Otis served on the Maryland Association of Boards of Education Legislative Committee, and served as one of the board's liaisons to the Education, Education Foundation of Baltimore County. Whereas Mr. Marnie Otis placed the needs of all students as his first priority, and whereas Mr. Marnie Otis has committed his time and expertise to the Baltimore County Public Schools community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County herewith assembled in regular session on the second day of February in the year 2016 recognizes the outstanding contributions of George J. Maniotis and be it further resolved that the board does herewith extend its deepest appreciation and gratitude for his dedication, loyalty, and service and further extends its best wishes for good health, happiness, and continued success in future endeavors. Congratulations so much. At this time, I would Mr. Chairman, I, to, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the resolution. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, carry. no. Thank you. Motion carries. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Maniotis to introduce any family he has with him tonight. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Charlie. I'd like to introduce my wife, uh, Lillian. <laughs> and uh, if she's in the room, uh, De Deborah. Uh, Deborah. So, and uh, uh, with Deborah is her friend Tom. <laughs> so, but again, uh, I just want to say a few words, even though I got a little technical difficulty with my hearing aid, I don't have to hear my own comments, but uh, I want to thank, um, I too want to thank, first, uh, Senator Dolores Kelly. Uh, Dolores, uh, approximately six years ago, approached me and asked me if I would like to be considered for the school board. And uh, I, I told her I would. Uh, and the, Dolores Kelly is an old friend and just an uh, outstanding senator from Baltimore County. Second, we went through a screening system. Uh, I, we had to be uh, recommended by the county executive. And I sincerely thank Jim Smith for, when he was the county executive, for referring me to Governor O'Malley for appointment. And finally, thank Governor O'Malley um, and his staff for the rigorous interviews that we went through uh, to be selected and um, uh, uh, be appointed by the governor. And I also want to thank uh, Ed Parker uh, because he was on the screening committee <coughs> that uh, 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 put me through the ringer uh, on two occasions to see if I um, I had the stuff and stamina to be a member of the Baltimore County Public School System. So indeed, yeah, I'm humbled, I'm, pr I'm proud uh, that we did something for the, the children of Baltimore County. And uh, let me just say this, I'm also proud that um, uh, the school board <laughs> put uh, their issues behind them and uh, uh, reappointed a uh, gentleman who's put his stamp on the, his own legacy here in Baltimore County, that's uh, Dr. Dallas Dance. Thank you very much. <laughs> At this time, we're going to ask one of our uh, board members that, that served with uh, George and Ed to uh, come forward, uh, Mr. Bowler, Mike Bowler. Yeah. Sure. Okay, go ahead, right ahead. <coughs> 
I want to thank uh, everyone for giving me a couple of minutes to talk, and I will, I promise it'll be more, no more than two minutes. I came out this evening to add my praise in honoring Ed and George for their long and distinguished service on the board. Membership on this board is true public, and I capitalize public and emphasize public service. Unpaid, largely unappreciated, and all in the name of improving the lives of 111,000 public school students in Baltimore County. The service is, in short, almost a higher calling. Neither of these men used the board for partisan or ideological campaigning. In fact, in my five years of experience, neither did any members of what I would call the old board. I may be dumb, but I never knew the politics of my fellow members. If we had red and blue seats, I guess I would have been several aisles over from Ed, awash in blue, and I always suspected that Larry Schmidt, the most effective school board president in my years, was a Republican, for God's sakes. <laughs> no, what these two you're honoring tonight have is integrity, that and a keen sense of caring and humor. Ed practices both principal PAL and principal PLE. He came to the board after a long career as a Baltimore County school and civic leader. Speaking of the latter, <coughs> I was talking Sunday to a former Baltimore County executive at a BSO concert. When I mentioned that I was coming here tonight, he said, quote, Ed and I clashed mightily on an issue some years ago. I was right and he was wrong. He won. But I never had the sense that he came to his views without thinking long and hard about coming to an on, uh, and coming to an honest conclusion, unquote. I saw those honest conclusions many times as I saw, sat over here across the way from uh, from Ed. Ed, he was not uh, a noisy man, as unfortunately I, I am. <laughs> uh, he would sit quietly and through a long argument on any issue, then simply vote A or nay without delivering a sermon. And even if I disagreed, which I often did, I knew that the A or nay was honest and principled. Would that members of our U.S. Congress disagreed with such civility. As for George, what can I say? If they gave out awards for twinkles in the eye, George would have the blue ribbon. George is such a modest man that you probably don't know that he quietly raises thousands of dollars each year for an organization called Buddies, the successor to the old Police Athletic League in Baltimore City, which of course has come to the fore in the wake of the Freddie Gray unrest. George's thinking, in fact, spans city and county. He knows that the two are quite literally joined at the hip, that the future of one is the future of the other, and that black lives matter in both. George is, of course, a notorious fixer. No problem is too small for George, who has a network of every Greek citizen within two states <laughs> on call 24-7. So here, uh, here is to the two gentlemen, two gentlemen and gentle men my life has been so enriched by having worked on this board with both, so have the lives of 111,000 Baltimore County school children, and I thank both of them. Thank you. We uh, have some other special recognitions today, a recognition of George Washington Carver School for the Arts and Technology. Um, I'd like to call up uh, Mrs. Steele, and uh, we'll start there. Thank you. Just 
Steele, I'd like to start by asking you to um, introduce any other staff you may have with you tonight. I believe we do have one staff member who snuck in through the side, Mr. Mike Laverde, our carpentry teacher and career and technology education department chair person, but he might be in the other room at this point in time. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's uh, with great pleasure that uh, I present this resolution. Um, it reads as follows, whereas George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology is one of the of one of only six schools from Maryland to be honored by the Maryland State Department of Education as a 2016 Maryland Blue Ribbon School. Uh, <clears throat> and whereas this Baltimore County High School was selected based on rigorous state requirements for high achievement and dramatic improvement, and George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology was joined in this honor by Hereford High School, which was also named a 2016 Maryland Blue Ribbon School. So that the Baltimore County Public Schools proudly claims one third of the Maryland schools this year to receive this prestigious honor. And whereas these two schools now join the roster of the 21 other county schools that have earned this rare honor, and the, these schools collectively collectively represent the potential of every Baltimore County school to ensure that all students graduate globally competitive and whereas this recognition for George Washington Carver Center for the Arts and Technologies brings attention to the strength and of the school's administrative and academic leadership the quality education and creativity of its teachers the enthusiasm and abilities of its students and the unwavering support the school received from involved parents and community partners. Now, therefore, it is resolved that the Board of Education, herewith assembled in regular session on the second day of February in the year 2016, expresses gratitude and sincere appreciation to the entire staff, student body, and technology for their hard work, foresight, vision, and extraordinary efforts in achieving this milestone. So congratulations wow. very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of the resolution. Second. All, All in all favor, right. signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Okay, this time I'd like to call up uh, Principal Jaira and <coughs> Mr. Jaira, do you have any other uh, folks from Hereford with you tonight? Well, I invited the entire leadership team and the entire staff and faculty, but we're working so hard to move to the next level with the national application that they're all home sleeping tonight, so no. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Mr. Jaira. Um, I'll, again, read the resolution. Whereas Hereford High School is one of only six schools from Maryland to be honored by the Maryland State Department of Education and as a 2016 Maryland Blue Ribbon School, and uh, this Baltimore County High School was selected based on rigorous state requirements for high achievement and dramatic improvement. And whereas Hereford High School was joined in this honor by George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology, which was also named a 2016 Maryland Blue Ribbon School, so that Baltimore County Schools proudly claims one third of the, Baltimore, of the Maryland schools this year to receive pr this prestigious honor. These schools, these two schools now join the roster of the 21 other county schools that have earned this rare honor. And these schools collectively represent the potential of every Baltimore County school to ensure that all students graduate globally competitive. And whereas, the, whereas this recognition for Hereford High School brings attention to the strength of the school's administration and academic leadership, the quality, dedication, and creativity of its teachers, the enthusiasm of its uh, and abilities of its students and the unwavering support of the that support the school receives from involved parents and community partners that now therefore it be it resolved that the board of education 
herewith assembled in regular session on the second day of February in the year 2016 expresses gratitude and sincere appreci appreciation to the entire staff, student body, and community of Hereford High School for their hard work, foresight, vision, and extraordinary efforts in achieving this milestone. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Mr. Chairman, I move, the, I move the adoption of the resolution. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The resolution's been adopted. I just wanted to take this opportunity just to recognize the hardworking staff, faculty, teachers, everyone, parents, students, because it's an honor for me to be the principal of Hereford High School, but it takes an entire school to be able to achieve an award like this. So thank you so much. Appreciate this. All right, our next agenda item is the uh, superintendent's report. Uh, Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, first off, before I begin, I have to say a special thank you to one group of employees who over the last 11 days have done some tremendous work, not just for our 175 school centers and programs and all of our offices, but they've also been working very closely with the county in terms of our roads, making sure that they were plowed, making sure that our buildings were maintained. And so if I could ask Pete Dixit and all the members of our facilities, maintenance and operations team, if you could please stand and would you all help me thank them for their work. for them and they're not in here, they're in the other room. <laughs> That's Pete. And, and Pete's waving like it's homecoming. Congratulations, Pete. <laughs> and, and, and thank you, Noah. Pete and I were just over at the planning board meeting defending our, our FY17 county capital budget. But um, we all know that when the governor issued the state of emergency and we got a historic almost 30 inches of snow, um, our folks were working directly hand in hand with Baltimore County government to make sure that roads were clear and that we actually got all of our students back into school as safely and as quickly as we could. And I know we lost six instructional days, but safety was our foremost priority. So thank you so much, Pete, uh, to you and your team for the work that, that the team did. I would remind our, our community that we've launched our stakeholder satisfaction survey for 2016. It launched yesterday, so throughout the month of February, if you go to bcps.org, you'll be able to take our stakeholder satisfaction survey. Um, last year, we got roughly 75,000 uh, responses. This year, we're shooting for well over 85,000 responses. Students in grades 4 through 12, parents, community members, staff, please participate in the survey. If you have multiple roles or you have students in multiple schools, definitely you can complete the survey uh, multiple times. I want to say a special thank you to Mr. Parker, Mr. Maniotis, and to Mr. Bowler. Thank you so much for your service. I know we just recognized you with your resolutions, but um, Ed Parker is a stand-up guy. Um, when I first got on the board, um, everyone told me I needed to meet Mr. Parker, not knowing that I had met Mr. Parker through my two rounds of interviews uh, with Mr. Parker. But the work that he had done, not just as a principal and a teacher and administrator, but also as a board member, is to be commended. And Mr. Maniotis, you and Mr. Bowler have given me some immense advice that I truly do appreciate, not just calling you um, my bosses over a period of time, but also my friends. So I really do um, appreciate that. Um, to this board, um, most recently you just spoke in um, reappointing me to this position, which I have to tell you is most humbling uh, to me. Uh, to this board, I've always said that this is a team of 13. No, I'm not a member of the board, but I cannot and we cannot as a team do this work without you. So I do appreciate the opportunity where many times we put our individual philosophical differences aside because at the end of the day, we have 112,000 kids who are watching us and our actions. So I look forward to the next four years of continuing the work with this board. Um, it is not a thankless position. Um, this is a volunteer board, but they put in well over 
five to 10, in some cases, 15, 20 hours a week, depending on committee assignments and board mem uh, meetings. So thank you so much uh, for your commitment to me. My commitment is definitely to you um, and to this school system. Uh, to our staff, um, thank you so much. Our principals, we have two of our phenomenal principals here tonight, but we have 175 principals who work day in and day out to make sure that the vision of our school system is carried forward. The <laughs> blueprint that this board approved is carried forward, and I cannot do this work without the leadership of our principals. Um, but most importantly, to our support staff and our teachers. Um, every day our teachers roll up the sleeves and, and, and the work is not just the role of a teacher. So our teachers are counselors, they're social workers, they're mom, they're dad, they're friends with our students and they're advocates for our students. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I know I had a conversation um, over text with Ms. Baden earlier who's welcoming her grandchild um, into the world. Uh, but thank you so much to our teachers and I look forward to supporting you um, over the next several years as well too. To our parents, our community, our elected officials, thank you so much for the support. Everyone knows that we do not fund ourselves um, as a school system. We get all of our dollars from our county and our state. And so a special thank you to our county executive, to our state legis uh, legislators. I really do appreciate the support that you give, not just to me, but to this entire school system. And I look forward to seeing our delegation Friday as we talk about updates that are going on um, within our school system. So I'm very, very excited over the next four years of the work that we have around Blueprint 2.0. Um, Blueprint 2.0 was a plan adopted in 2013 by this board and by our community. It's not, and I said this again, it's not a Dallas Dance plan. Our community said we wanted Blueprint 2.0. Right? This board reaffirmed that commitment to that plan in 2015. It talks about a very bold theory of action that students have to be um, given access to an effective digital learning environment and learn a second language prior to graduation. We cannot waver from that commitment. Philosophically, we can disagree about how we might, in fact, get to that end result. Um, we can disagree that we, how we might get there, but the goal has to remain the same because we have to make sure every single kid get there. But we can do that, though, without being mean, mean-spirited, hateful or disrespectful to one another. Um, I go by again and I talk to kids all the time. Um, and yes, I did talk to students Sunday who said they were happy to go back to school. <laughs> um, but we, we don't, our kids are watching how we treat each other, how we respect each other. So we can still get to our end result without being mean, hurtful and disrespectful uh, to each other. And that includes quoting inaccurate information. So when we went forward with STAT, and I stand by and I'm a believer of it. And I'm not a believer of giving just laptops to kids because that's not innovative. Transforming teaching and learning in the classroom where kids take ownership of their own learning and they're working hard to teachers, that's innovative. And that's what I'm proud of that's happening in our classrooms. We're not there yet, but we have a long way to go and we're well on our way there. But we can't get there with inaccurate data that are out there. So let me be clear, STAT does not cost and will not cost $350 million. It will not. We've been very clear, the board held this work session last month um, with it. It was the last page of the spreadsheet. We were very upfront in terms of the cost of the initiative, but let me be clear, when we put that budget together, and George Saris and I probably know that budget on the same page with each other because we spend so much time together. We do a zero-based approach to make sure that every single line item of that budget matches our priorities in Blueprint 2.0. And let me be clear, I am not going to recommend anything to this board or put this school system or this county into an initiative that is not sustainable. But I am clear that I want to make sure that we look at all of our students and give them the access they need to a globally competitive education. And I will stand by that. I will meet with anybody in our community. As you guys know, I have met with anybody in our community. But we have to be respectful to each other. We can't inaccurately quote one another. And we can't put lies and innuendos out there because our kids are looking at us and our community does not deserve that. So I look forward over the next four years continuing to build what I call and what we all call Team BCPS. Because any organization is all built on culture. And the culture of an organization has to be built on the sustainability of leadership. And that's why I was very clear early on in the school year that I wanted to stay. That's why my commitment is staying another four years, if not more, uh, to make sure we continue out the work. But no better person can tell us what Team BCPS is than our students. And so that's why our star video for the night really highlights our Team BCPS culture that we've created with our kids telling the story. Hi, I'm Max, and this is BCPS. I'm no 
Silva. Max and I are both students in the Baltimore County Public School. <laughs> in my opinion, BCPS is one of the very best public school systems in the whole country. And here are just a few of the reasons why. All elementary schools are now STAT schools. S-T-A-T. -T. Students and teachers accessing tomorrow. When I first heard about it, all I knew is that everybody was going to get their own computers. What I didn't know is that STAT changes everything, and I mean everything. Now I get to work on my own, with my friends, with the computer, without the computer. I get to make a lot more decisions, which is pretty cool for an elementary school. And 25 of our elementary schools are passport schools. That means that we get to learn Spanish starting in the fourth grade instead of waiting until middle or high school. Hablas Espanol? We do! Here's Max and some more info on what BCPS is all about in our middle schools. Hi, I'm Madison. BCPS is 175 schools, 111,000 students, it's the 25th largest school system in the nation. But those are just numbers. What makes BCPS special is the people, like these people, my teachers, and my friends. We're different races, live in different neighborhoods, we have different ideas, but that just makes us more interesting. When you're my age, people always say, so Madison, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I have no idea yet, but the more I learn in school, the more I can figure that out. I am learning so much. And now, my middle school competes against other middle schools in after school sports, like track and field, basketball, tennis, and cross country. And that's just the beginning. Hey Natalie, tell us more about BCPS. Sure, Madison, this is my high school, and year after year, it is named one of the best high schools in the nation. In fact, three quarters, 75% of our high schools are among the best in the nation. We have 23 Maryland Blue Ribbon schools and 18 National Blue Ribbon schools. We are among the nation's largest school districts with one of the highest graduation rates. Our superintendent has been recognized by the White House as a champion of change and serves on a presidential advisory commission. And one of our teachers was the 2014 National Teacher of the Year. Awards are great, but they celebrate what's already happened. At BCPS, we care about what happens next, too. For me, that means college, career, life. But how well we succeed in life isn't just up to us. It also depends on you. BCPS is all of us and all of you. So join Team BCPS. Stay in touch with us. Sign up for our e-newsletter. Volunteer with the school, partner with us, and donate. I am. I am. I am. I am. Team So one additional. One additional person as I conclude the superintendent's report whom I'd like to recognize this evening, um, and I don't see him now, but would Dr. Mark Bedell please stand? And he may be in the other room. Um, and as uh, Mr. Smith is going to get him, for those of you who do not know, um, Mark Bedell will be leaving us um, soon uh, to take over as superintendent of schools for Kansas City uh, Public Schools. So I'm extremely proud of Dr. Bedell and the work that he's done with our high schools, uh, but I wanted to publicly recognize him for the work uh, because in a, a few days we're going to be releasing the graduation rate for the class of 2015, and that's because of the work that Dr. Bedell has done. So congratulations, Dr. Bedell. And Dr. Bedell said, I'm nervous, and I said, you should be. So congratulations, <laughs> Doc. We appreciate it. story out there in Kansas City. Did you read the story about him in Canada? Yeah, he got a standing ovation in Kansas City. Uh, yeah, so uh, congratulations, Mark. We're proud of you. It's great. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, our next uh, agenda item is the chair's report, and I just have some brief comments for this evening. I would like to begin by thanking all those around the county who have contributed input regarding the operating budget, heat policy, and the superintendent's renewal 
uh, in recent weeks. Uh, it is extremely evident that they are very interested and concerned constituents in Baltimore County. Um, attaining a broad range of perspectives helps the board in making informed decisions in all of those areas. Um, there are many important issues facing the board as we move into 2016. Although there may be some varying thoughts on strategy and tactics, we must keep and, um, and prioritize student learning and achievement in all those decisions. We as board members will continue to strive to understand how to best support our teachers and administrators so they may, may utilize their wonderful talents and skills most effectively. I truly believe that we have a board that consists of individuals who are focused on enhancing the educational opportunities of our students. I would like to thank my fellow board members for their contributions of time, energy, and knowledge. We have board members that bring unique skills and talents to our missions. Finally, I would like to publicly thank Dr. Dance and his staff for the information and responses that have been provided in association with the review of the budget. We hope to work together diligently to achieve what is best for the students, teachers, and administrators of Baltimore County Schools. So thank you. Those are my comments for tonight. And now we'll move into our student board member comments, Ms. Walia. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels. Good evening, Team BCPS. I hope everyone enjoyed their week off. I know students were extremely grateful and happy about their week off of school. Um, it's hard to going back to school yesterday after about 10 days off, but I know students were excited to see their friends and teachers. But we're already halfway down to the school year. Seniors, you only have about 14 weeks left in the school year. It's that time of the year when you're receiving college admission letters and planning on where you want to go after high school. As you make these big decisions, always remember that there's someone there to support you. Talk to your teachers, your counselors, assistant principals, or any adult in the building that you trust if you need help. Being a senior myself, I understand what you're going through, so please feel, feel, free, feel free to email me. I'm a resource for you. It's also the time of the year when we start selecting the next student member of the Board of Education. The applications went out January 22nd are due to Ms. Nora Murray by February 26th. These applications are available on the BCPS website under the student member of the board page. My goal for this year is to have every high school nominate a candidate to become the next mob. SMOB is a very rewarding position, please, I know it is, and we need someone who will be able to represent the 111,000 students of Baltimore County Public Schools to the best of his or her ability. Every high school has students that are capable of to serve in this position, so please encourage your principal to nominate you, a current, sophomore, or junior. In order to find out more information about the SMOB and the selection process, please check out the BCPS website, as the process has changed this year. I'm visiting more schools in the second half of the year. I've come such scheduled visits in the next couple of months, including one this Thursday. Therefore, if you see me in your school, please come and say hi and talk to me. I would be more than happy to be, talk to you, and I would be more visible in the next few months. Again, I'm your vote, so please feel free to email your, me your thoughts. My email is dwally at bcps.org. Or you can respond to my survey to provide me with your feedback on the school system and or your specific school. The link to the survey is on the student member of the board webpage on the BCPS website. Le lastly, like Dr. Dan said, I also encourage students to respond to the Baltimore County Stakeholder Survey. The survey takes no more than five minutes to complete, so let's work together to better our school system. And thank you, and that concludes this small report for this month. Thank you, Ms. Walia. We might move right along into our public comment section of our agenda. Um, this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration, even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public, public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe our timer behind me, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. At this time, I would like to call up our uh, members of our uh, advisory and stakeholder group. Our first speaker is from the Baltimore S County Student Council, Mr. Nick Burton Prately. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Dance on um, on his new contract. I uh, I know that, unfortunately, I will not get to experience the next four years, but I and I have the utmost confidence that uh, students graduating within the next four years, students enrolled in the school system within the next four years, are in very good hands. So congratulations. Um, Baltimore County Student Council has been very busy um, going into the second half of the year, trying to keep students engaged and. Um, trying to keep participation up. Um, just this past weekend, uh, we sent students to the LEAD conference in D.C., um, Deeksha being one of them, um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to tell you more about it if you asked. Um, in fact, she also taught a workshop there to students from around the country and students from uh, various school systems around the world, so I'm sure that was a fantastic experience, and uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to tell you more about it. Um, as as Deeksha mentioned earlier, uh, the SMOB process is in full swing. Um, we're starting to receive applications for the forum uh, to vote on the next student member, so we're very excited about where that's going to go uh, within the next few months. Um, in addition, we will be sending students to Annapolis this month um, for our annual advocacy day, uh, where we will uh, discuss with legislators, legislators different uh, bills and youth-related issues that are uh, relevant to students in the county and um, give them a little student input on what's going through uh, Annapolis right now. Uh, we will also be having our elections in a few months' time for our officer positions next year. Unfortunately, I have to relinquish uh, my position to my predecessor or my uh, who, uh, successor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but that is something uh, we're looking forward to. And we also have our next General Assembly meeting coming up in March, um, which is always a, a very interesting time. So thank you. Thank you, Nick, very much. Um, our next speaker for the evening is uh, representing TABCO, Mr. John Redmond Palmer. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the Board of Education. I am John Redmond Palmer. I'm the Vice President of TABCO, and I'm bringing the following brief remarks to you on behalf of Abby Baton, who couldn't be here tonight. I know Abby's watching the board meeting tonight from her uh, son's house, where she is hopefully able to watch it if her granddaughter will allow her to, her new <laughs> granddaughter. <laughs> Even though I'm unable, um, the monumental snowstorm Jonas reminded us that Mother Nature is a much greater power than mere mortals. One storm system wiped out all of our inclement weather days, yet here we are in another warm up trend, and forecasters are saying there's a possibility of another storm down the road. We applaud the school system and Dr. Dance for understanding the need for our safety of our children and staff during this unprecedented weather event. People are still digging out from this storm almost a week and a half later. Without the warmer days and some rain, who knows how much longer it would have taken. As we work through the inclement weather policy and rules, we must remember Mother Nature is the one who is really in charge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is representing the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Jacqueline Cade. Good evening. Good evening. Congratulations, Dr. Dance. And on behalf of the Special Education <coughs> Citizens Advisory Council, we thank you for your support of our every child in Baltimore County, including those with special needs. My technology might fail me, so. <laughs> At our November meeting, we presented recommendations to Dr. Dance concerning special education needs in our, for our students in Baltimore County. And I'm pleased to speak to you about the, one of the recommendations for elementary school students. I have two children progressing at Woodhome Elementary School. One is a um, fourth grader with a learning disability. She was diagnosed with um, several challenges at about the age of 18 months and through child find and infants and toddlers and the awesome staff at Woodhome, she was able to sort of matriculate out of some of her needs into more specific needs where we can hone in on some of her um, more specific learning challenges. But the reason why I'm passionate about social skills integration in all of our elementary school curricula is that in that November meeting, every other group who presented on the upper ages, including high school, college and career and adult, indicated they had experiences with their children having a difficult time integrating into a normal routine operating environment without having social skills support. And so we urge you to consider including the social skills 
uh, component to every curricula for elementary school students. As staff progresses and children become more engaged with technology, it will be more challenging for them to relate and work together in group settings. And research has shown, I, I can quote a few articles, but I'm watching my time, that children who engage in group activities and social development, including time at recess, are more able to adapt in school and in non-school related activities where they have to interact with their peers. They enjoy coming to school more. One of our group members has a fourth grader as well and she mentioned that her teacher, that her child's teacher reported that her child is disengaged and doesn't seem interested in learning. Her child reported to her that that's because my teacher doesn't understand me. And so we think that, we strongly believe that helping our teachers to keep their students engaged and to relate to each other and to adults will further them not only in their education but in their life skills as a whole. So we thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about this recommendation and urge you to consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kay. <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker is representing Case, uh, Mr. Bill Lawrence. <coughs> I realized the other day that um, uh, there are two of us, my wife and I at home, and we now own four devices, mm -hmm. um, two regular computers, one desktop, and uh, a tablet, so I'm not, and that doesn't include the phone, so I'm not sure uh, how much more digitally connected uh, I can be. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman evening. McDaniels, uh, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance. Ralph Waldo Emerson stated that every institution is the lengthening shadow of a single individual. To that point, I first want to congratulate Dr. Dance uh, on his reappointment. Case looks forward to continuing our unfinished business and providing an excellent education for our 112,000 students. I also want to recognize and thank this board for its work and dedication to the most important process with which you are charged. The selection and retention of a superintendent is a weighty responsibility, and I know that the past five months have not been easy. However, this evening you have completed your task and will now work to bind the relationships between members and the superintendent. I hope that each of you is proud of your work as you continue moving forward to put students and their education first. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Okay, we'll move into our public comment portion of the meeting and our first speaker for the evening is Mr. David Green. Good evening. Um, congratulations, Dr. Dance. Um, I'd like to welcome you back. Uh, glad to have you back. Um, I've tweaked you before about use it, you, exaggerating a little bit and uh, using terms like world class, and I'd like to use it myself if I, if I have your permission. Um, I, th I think you have a world class motor and a huge amount of energy, and if, uh, if we're gonna implement something, I'd like you on my team leading that team. So glad to have you back. Um, and so if, if we don't get good results with someone like you, I think we would have to look to the board and say, hey, how come we didn't get results from this guy? And so I look to the board to do two things. One is if Dr. Dance makes a mistake, uh, to take him aside and say, please don't do that again. Uh, he, he's made a few and he'll make some more. That's the nature of uh, business. Um, and the other thing is uh, sometimes to slow him down. He's gonna go at warp speed and sometimes he needs to be slowed down, I think. And uh, so here I'm looking for the lawyers here. I think lawyers tend to be quite good at slowing things down. So I believe <laughs> you and you and you, and do we just have three lawyers? No, there's um, more than that. Four. Four. <laughs> four, four lawyers. And so I'd like to tell a story. Uh, we talk about cutting edge technology and 21st century technology. I work for a company like that. It was one of the first internet grocers and uh, we started out in Boston and we expanded to DC before we figured out how to make a profit in Boston. In Boston. And guess what? We ran out of money. Um, so I, I'm getting a little bit of uh, deja vu all over again here 
And I think we really need to look at STAT and see where we can slow it down and measure results. So I'm looking to the board to do that. Um, and then I, I just had a comment on one board member I'm still trying to figure out, Ms. Ms. Eaton, sometimes uh, you have weddings and, pe and they have an announcement about people, the, the, the people that came the longest distance to, to the wedding. And I think you're one of the board members that has the longest drive, if I'm not mistaken. And so the, particularly the people that uh, represent the Southwest and the Southeast, uh, I'd like to sort of congratulate you for making that drive and fighting beltway traffic. And um, you, you remind me though of, and so I mean, it's very important to represent those communities because they make it, they, it's harder for the people to come up here and speak themselves. So uh, one thing I've observed about you, Ms. Eaton, is uh, I think the longest sentence I've heard you say is, uh, I'm good. And so I'm kind of waiting for you to open, rip off your, your uh, civilian disguise and do some super superhero kind of stuff and looking forward to your participation on the board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Green. Our next speaker is um, just listed as uh, White. I'm not sure the first name. Uh, I don't know if it's a Mr. White or Mrs. White. Uh, All right, uh, we're going to move to our third speaker for the uh, evening, uh, Kaya Johnson. <laughs> and we just ask if one, well, only one person can uh, come up at a time, please. Thank you. About a few weeks ago, you had other people. Yeah. We, we, we uh, ask that only one person come up uh, at a time. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the standard now? Yes. Okay. I can go? Yes. Okay. Good, Thank um, you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, first, I want to congratulate Dr. Dance on his reappointment. Um, my matter is the Milford Mill ban. Um, the teacher was abruptly removed, and I'm just here to speak on it. My parent. Um, we, the proud parents of the band students at Milford Mill Academy, want plain and simple for Mr. Goff to be restored to his um, position immediately. Our children have been tremendously impacted in a negative way due to the abrupt and unnecessary removal of Mr. Goff. We sent our children on these trips with Mr. Goff completely aware of where they are going and what they're doing when they're coming back home and whatever we need to know. We already know. We trust Mr. Goff completely. Um, we trust him because those are his children too. They're not just our children. He has the best interests in, in mind and the only lack of communication we've had is with the administration and the school and the Board of Education because of all of this that's going on. That's the only lack of communication that we've had. Um, we will, we were well informed for all trips, funds, or any changes that did or did not occur with the ban. There was nothing Mr. Gove did or didn't do that we weren't aware of. So restore him now, restore him, and you'll restore our children's foundation because without the foundation, there's no building. Our children are hurting. That's all I say. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Congratulations, Dr. Dance, on your second term. And good evening, education leaders and community members. My speech tonight is dedicated to my father, Glennie Moore, uh, as he fight uh, for his life while I am fighting for justice and equality in education. My speech is also for all of the victors who have endured unfair adversities due to their race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, age, income, or simply using their freedom of speech and expression. So tonight I would like to share a sports analogy 
with you entitled The Big Upset. We are currently approaching a critical part of the high school and college basketball seasons when teams have to play with unity despite their individual differences. Now February is usually the turning point for a lot of basketball teams and this is the time when players collectively decide whether or not they want to be the champions of their region, state, or division. Also, by this time of the basketball season, teams have celebrated some wins and endured some losses. However, despite the season's losses, the results during March Madness reflects the outcome of hard work, courage, and perseverance. As a former athlete, I've learned that it doesn't matter what your season record is, how many accolades you've received, or how many star players you have on your team. The championship title is not discriminatory. The final title belongs to the individuals or teams who, is not, who are not complacent and have a strong desire to win for a greater purpose than themselves. Now, of course, the fans and critics expect the team or individuals with the winning record or the team who have powerful and talented players to win the big game, just like money, power, connections, and prestige usually help win political positions. But in sports, most people will not look at the athletes on the underdog's team as having the caliber or the capacity to help win the final game or a championship. Moreover, some team members have viewed only their star players as one of the ones who could help win critical games during the regular season, overlooking players who often watch the game from the bench. So can someone who has been called a practice player, a bench warmer, compete on such an el elite level? I just know from my experience, when you come to a game wanting to win, you have to get in a competitive mental zone that no one can take you out of. I'm closing. Not even white supremacy. I never would have thought I would be going head to head with white supremacy in the education system, but God will put you in game situations in life that will help your team to become believers again. Achievers again. <laughs> And winners again, because freedom, respect, and opportunity belongs to all of us. Not just them, but us too. Happy Black History Month. Don't forget, hashtag compete with purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Rosen. Thank you. I was recently talking with my school-aged daughter. She's in elementary school, and she was asking me about speaking at a Board of Education meeting in January. We found the video of the session, and she watched it. She said she wanted to speak, too. When I asked her what she wanted to say, she recalled a recent lesson she had learned about Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and she said this. I want to speak out like Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. for people. People need food. We should follow the rules so we can have what we need. Nobody buys fancy things until everybody has what they need. There are lots of people who need food and clothes. I transcribed her words on paper, and at the bottom she wrote, do not buy computers. I asked her if she would prefer more teachers or more computers, and she quickly answered, more teachers. To be fair, her primary motivation for speaking at a Board of Education meeting also included wanting to speak into a microphone. So in order to preserve her bedtime and everyone's eardrums, I have not allowed her the opportunity to speak tonight. But I want you to know that when you explain to children the trade-offs for their beloved one-to-one -one tablets, they understand that it is a luxury that we cannot afford. My daughter is not the most altruistic kid out there. She is a regular kid who, when given the option, prefers the company of people to computers. For example, she would be happy, happy using her tablet for a short time every day or for only one day of the week to allow a rotation in which all classrooms have the same access to the tablets. 
Like many multi-person use in computers, separate logins could provide individualized learning without the price tag of four-year contracts for tablets for 110,000 students, especially when we don't yet know about uh, learning outcomes any differently than small traditional classrooms. My daughter referenced Martin Luther King Jr. in our discussion and it has made me wonder what he would think of the STAT initiative in a school system that has individuals with so many basic needs unmet. I do not believe that giving each child a one-to-one -one tablet is leveling the playing field. I believe it is depleting our resources in the county schools of what our youngest and most vulnerable children need most, safety, including new buildings, improvements, safe bus transportation, and temperature control, and more meaningful interactions with caring adults. And as my daughter reminded me, these resources could also be used to provide food for those in need. Please consider creative uses of the tablets we have already signed contracts for and reducing the time our youngest children will spend on these tablets. As a parent and stakeholder, I would like to see quantitative data that shows academic outcomes in relation to STAT before the end of three years as developed with the Johns Hopkins logic model. I am concerned that three years is too long to wait to find out what is or is not working, especially for our youngest learners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Our next speaker is Beverly Grace. Good evening, Dr. Dance and board members. My name is Beverly Grace, and I'm here to request the immediate reinstatement of Mr. James Goff Sr. to Milford Mill Academy as their band director. It's my belief that he was unfairly and unjustly dismissed in front of the band back in October 2015. This is my second time I've been with the band. First time my children were in the band. Now my grandson is in the band. He was about three or four when my kids were in the band. And he said then, I want to play drums for Mr. Golf when I get in high school. And he's living his dream right now. <clears throat> Mr. Golf has built the Milford Mill Academy band program from nothing to having no, um, nationwide and worldwide notoriety playing in Bermuda, Africa, several NFL teams here, different parades around the country, doing um, college tournament bowls. So they're, they're excellent. YouTube them, you'll see what I'm talking about. And each time we've traveled outside of Maryland, we the parents of the guardians, we received itineraries, we had to sign permission slips, so we knew everything that was going on. Uh, we knew when they were leaving, when they were coming back, everything. Sometimes a lot of these children, they wouldn't have had these opportunities to travel outside. They'd never been to Niagara Falls without going to the, with the band. They've had a lot of different exposures to different things. They would have never gotten it without being in the Milford Mill Academy band under the direction of Mr. James Goff. And he's done so many other things. He's taken kids up and down the East Coast <coughs> for college auditions to get into school when their parents couldn't. He's taken money out of his own pockets to feed them if they come to school hungry. Um, if they go on the trips and their parents forgot to give them money, he feeds them. He makes sure that they are well taken care of. And this is a disservice to the children. They are not happy. A lot of them, their college recommendations haven't been, their seniors, they haven't been done because he's not there. He's put in 22 years of service at Milford. He has built that program up, and we need to get him back. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Grace. Our next speaker is Chris Zach. Members of the board, Dr. Dance, I first bring you warm fraternal greetings from the officers of the Lansdowne High School PTSA, its students and its staff, many of whom are in attendance this evening. 
I'd like to alert you to a fascinating uh, development that happened in our January meeting. In one week, this group brought together nearly 900 community members for a single cause in the form of a simple petition which says this, build a new high school for the community of Lansdowne. Due to this community activism, the Lansdown, latest Lansdowne High School PTSA meeting quadrupled in attendance. Last night, Hailthorpe Elementary's PTA had a vote and was unanimously in support of this resolution to build a new high school for Lansdowne. We also have public support from the Lansdowne Improvement Association, Moses Rodriguez, Riverview Improvement Association, Bill Brophy, and the Lansdowne Riverview Recreational Council. In addition, we have individual supporters, students, parents, teachers, who are all here this evening making sacrifices coming up from south, you know, where we are for this reason. They know their convictions are strong. They are looking to the future, and the future is that Lansdowne needs a new high school. For us to obtain a safe building is not a privilege, it's our right. We should have a safe and good school. Last month, some issues that we've had. Last month, we had a large storage closet in our gym condemned due to the discovery of exposed asbestos. Students regularly go into that room. We store equipment and costumes in that room. Dance costumes for the dance troops had to be discarded because they were laden with asbestos from some of the work we did. This is not good. After an incident like this, we're convinced the high school is not going to be safe during a renovation for long-term health. And as a personal thought, my mother's two brothers served in World War II. They both had mesothelioma. It is not nice. Besides the health risks or five-year renovation that the county is proposing, the building also has poor air, ven air ventilation, sinking foundation, broken heating system, recurring leaking pipes, flooding, small classrooms, broken PA, broken sinks where we need sinks, brown drinking water, and finally, it is not ADA compliant throughout the entire building. There is no way for my son, when he has foot problems, to be able to get up to the second floor. That being said, in closing, I would like to say as the treasurer and as thinking about this, this is not physically responsible to do a $31 million renovation. We request that you build a new school for Lansdowne High. We also would like to have portable window AC units built in as soon as possible as an interim measure while we're building the new school. Finally, I think this is the thing that we need to be able to give our students that globally competitive opportunity that we all strive for here at Baltimore County Public Schools. My children are there. I'm there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gazat. Our next speaker is Kevin Hill. Oh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Congratulations, Hill. Dr. Dance, and everyone else on the board for the great job that you guys do with the difficult tasks of taking care of so many children. Um, I'm also here on behalf of Dr. I mean, not Dr. Uh, James Goff, the Milford Mill Band Director. I just want to give you a brief history. Both of my children have been involved in the performing arts school from middle school on to present. One just recently. Uh, graduated ironically from Lansdowne High School. She's in Hollins University majoring in dance as well as business. My other son is graduating this year. They both have participated in the All Honors Dance and Band. Uh, my son was uh, a recipient of uh, Champions of Courage last year. Uh, he wrote an essay about me, and I'd like to pat myself on the back for that, but I cannot take all of that credit. You know, there's many people with many gifts, and um, when you run across someone like Mr. Goff, you, how can I put this? He he's just has a knack for working with kids. I've watched this man <clears throat> control a hundred or more teenage kids and the respect and joy that they had for him it's just phenomenal you know and and the only reason I came out tonight is because if I don't advocate for the kids that are starting ninth grade on and for my child and show him that you know if someone does a great work with you 
stand behind them. You know, do, do something to, to show some appreciation. I'm a little nervous tonight, but, you know, normally I'm a great speaker. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm basically saying that this, this guy is just, he's a special guy. And, and he's taken my son for four years on different trips. I've never felt uncomfortable with any place he's taken him. I trust him with my child. Um, and I just want you guys to consider, I know it's a very difficult job. You guys take care of a lot of issues. But in your consideration, I'd like you to think about this moment and this gentleman that you haven't met. But I can tell you that sometimes when, this is not just a regular band, when they're practicing outside and people are driving down the street, they'll stop just to listen to the, you know, the, the band played. I mean, it, it was just a phenomenal thing to see. And, you know, I'm trying to put a picture to the situation so you guys can have a better perspective of what happened there. Thank you so much for your time. I'm a little hoarse tonight, but have a great evening. All Thank right. you, Mr. Hill. <laughs> Our next speaker is Mary Duvall. Good evening. Good evening. I'm a senior at Lansdowne High School, and I'm here because I believe a new school should be built. Our school is over 50 years old, and it's time for a new, safe, and healthy school for all students and staff. We do not have air conditioning as classroom temperatures are double of what the outside temperatures are. This interferes with student learning and serves as a distraction. Our heating system is also very poor. Sitting in class, cold air comes through the heating system. Our plumbing is old and falling apart, leaving fil filthy water for individuals to drink. Because of the plumbing issues, the school obtains horrendous odors. The school is not accessible to handicapped people as well, as we do not have ramps or elevators for them. Our school is consumed with asbestos in the walls and floors, as well as our school is literally sinking into the lake behind our school. To conclude, Lansdowne High School has always been on the back burner of the schools, as nicer parts of Baltimore County are given stuff on the spot, where we have to wait years to get things we desperately need. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our last speaker for the evening is Linda Sproul. Good evening. I'm not good at this, but I'm a parent of. Um, let me get. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm a parent of. Uh, my child goes to Milford Mill Academy. I'm here to represent Mr. Golf. He is an excellent um, band director. He is very supportive. He's like a counselor, father. As a single parent, he really supports kids. The Throughout the trips, he's very responsive, along with the parents who's attending the trips. Um, since the last one uh, event that they went on in October, it hasn't been the same. Some of the students has really been not themselves, including my son. He's been there for three years. He is a junior. Um, I must say, it wasn't a good process the way Mr. Goff was <clears throat> removed from the band. Um, we only received messages. Um, I think I sent an a email to Mr. Dance um, and your response. Um, but as far as any details, as far as why Mr. Goff was actually removed or wasn't returning, it was not acknowledged to any of the parents or students. And that was unfair to us as well as Mr. Goff. On my um, support here for Mr. Goff, I would like for his position to be, for him to return to his position. He's very supportive in the students. He was able to give some students who doesn't travel the opportunity to go to places where no child or student can attend. 
We've been to Canada. We've been to um, New York. And there's been full support from the parents as well as supporting the students and Mr. Goff. He was there always. Um, we approve of Mr. Goff. He's like a father, and I'm here to support for his return, to return back to Milford Mill Academy Bay as the director. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, agenda item is old business. Uh, we have some third readings of policy, and I'll turn that over to Ms. Williams. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to everyone. Before I do so, I would just um, make a request that um, the situation involving Mr. James Goff be uh, briefed with the board. Be I realize this is a personnel matter and that we can't discuss it openly. Um, but the only thing we were told was that it's under investigation and during a private um, session I would like to have further update. Okay. Um, at this time, um, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend board policies 1100 and 5000 and to delete board policy 2342. The comments received on these policies were those made during the public comment period at the January 5th meeting. Staff is available should board members have any questions. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee? So moved. All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Can we have discussion? I'd like to break out policy 2342 if we could. All right. Well, um, 1100. Yeah. And, um, to, there's a motion to delete policy 2342 also. So uh, we'll break out uh, policy uh, 2342. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to break out 5,000. I'm on the PRC committee, and I think there's some errors in uh, what's, what's in front of folks. All right. Well, very we'll, minor, but there's some errors. We'll vote on the policies one at a time or discuss okay. them one at a time. Um, do I have a motion to accept um, the uh, revisions of policy 1100? So moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries for policy 1100. All right, do I have a motion to accept uh, the proposal on policy 5000? And then we'll have so moved. All right, and now uh, there's discussion about uh, 5,000. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, there's some antiquated um, use of commas that are actually kind of been cleaned up elsewhere. And in this particular one, um, this antiquated series with a comma following uh, maybe the next to the last item in a series, uh, that's uh, old style, and we've changed that in other policies. And that's specifically in... Uh, uh, the comments about equitable, comma, safer, comma. Well, that comma shouldn't be there. F, under business, it says business. There's a comma there. That doesn't belong there. And under G, removal of a comma after the word stakeholders. All right. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much the, what we had discussed in our meetings. And I think just uh, staff, however uh, thoughtful and however diligent uh, and however attentive, I think it just got past them. All right. Since these are grammatical changes, can we um, agree to accept the proposals with the grammatical changes uh, as uh, proposed by Mr. Virch? Yes, so, we can. All right. <laughs> all in favor of, the, of accepting the changes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, Is that a change? Okay. All right. Now, um, can I have a motion to accept the, uh, to delete policy 2342? So moved. All right, now the discussion. Yeah, I thought that uh, the reason for deleting policy 2342 was that it was duplicative of, I believe it was policy 1210. Is that right, Ms. Williams? I believe that's Do correct. You, staff is here if you yeah. want to, if staff He's wants also. to. Um, I, I think it would be wise of us f to have the PRC review policy 1210 prior to the deletion of policy 2342 and it could actually be done you know, simultaneously when we review and accept 1210 then at that time we could delete policy 2342. I would like to offer that as a motion. 
to uh, to have the PRC review policy 1210 prior to the deletion of policy 2342. I believe we have reviewed policy 1210. When was that reviewed? Do we have a date on when it was reviewed? It was at one of the PRC's meetings. So, so yes. Ann, are you saying you want the entire board to review that before? Because we send these out, but PRC does review whatever's being deleted. And it was well, at the same the regular PRC process meeting. for policy 1210. Right, and it was. At that same meeting. Was that this year or just recently? I, I don't know. Yes. I'm not aware of it. Yeah. It was January of this yeah. year. Okay. All right. Then I, okay. I withdraw. Thanks. All right. Um, then let's, uh, that we have a motion. Uh, all in favor of uh, moving forward with the deletion of policy 2342, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Williams. All right, our, our next agenda item is reviewing the proposed FY17 operating budget. The superintendent's proposed FY27 operating budget was introduced to the board on January 5th, 2016. A public hearing was held on January 12th, 2016. The public provided the board with many valuable comments and perspectives on how and why we as a school system allocate and spend the budget. The board then held a public work session on January 19th, 2016 at which time a comprehensive report was provided by staff and substantial discussion took place along with several votes detailing the board's direction with the budget. During and also after the work session, board members have submitted several questions and have received responses from staff. This has been a most comprehensive budget submission by the superintendent and provides the necessary components for BCPS to continue the work as outlined in Blueprint 2.0. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Dance and the staff for their work on this inclusive budget and also for their time and effort to help each board member understand the many components that have developed this final version of the 2017 operating budget. As we move forward to vote on the budget, let us keep in mind that we are building our future and investing in our most precious asset, the students of Baltimore County Public Schools. Once approved by the board, the budget will be forwarded to the county executive on or before March 1st, 2016, as required by law. So now I turn it over to Ms. Saris, to Mr. Saris to present the item to the board. Uh, good evening, we made uh three changes to the budget uh, in keeping with the board's uh, recommendations from the work session, which were to add uh, $10 million to one-time expenditures for school air conditioning and to add the position of an internal auditor and an administrative assistant to the um, board's uh, office staff. And the total, uh, so that the general fund budget uh, has changed by $10,182,214. Uh, all of the uh, other funds that make up the budget, uh, special revenue, uh, which are grants, debt service, enterprise fund, which is food and nutrition services, uh, the internal service workers compensation fund and the capital project fund all remain unchanged. So those three item, three line items uh, only affected the general fund portion of the budget, um, which increased from uh, one million four hundred, one billion, excuse me, four hundred fifty-six million three hundred eighty-six thousand one hundred thirty-four dollars to one billion four hundred sixty-six million five hundred sixty-eight thousand three hundred forty-eight dollars. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve uh, Exhibit M M one? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. Is there some discussion? I have, I have a question. Yes. Um, the budget goes to the county executive at this point. Uh, once approved, we will um, take all this information, create another 
publication and uh, no later than March 1st submit that to the county executive and the county the county executive uh, has the prerogative of deleting items and then sending it away. in other words it doesn't come back to us if the, the county executive wants to delete an item it, it's deleted and then goes to the county council was that the process the executive can add or delete items to the budget and then would not come back to the board uh, for any input but rather send it on to the to the council thank you uh, miss miller yes hi mr saris um, there's been a lot of discussion not only among board members regarding stat and the sustainability of stat but uh, from the public as well can you tell me uh, is stat sustainable in the long run well um, it is and I answered that question in writing so what I <laughs> I might prefer to do is just read back my answer so that it's clear that if all the board members have not heard it that um, that everybody is getting uh, the same information Uh, BCPS is fiscally dependent on local, state, and federal funding, as is every Maryland local education agency except Baltimore City. In fact, BCPS is a component unit of county government and has no autonomous authority to generate revenue, incur debt, or appropriate and use reserves. Local county funding is the largest and most flexible resource for public education in our county. Every significant instructional program, labor agreement, or capital project represents a major fiscal commitment for Baltimore County Public Schools and Baltimore County government and requires BCPS to partner with county government before undertaking such long-term obligations. The county government supports that it has funded STAT for two consecutive years. Uh, therefore, in my opinion, yes, it is sustainable. And as part of the basis of that answer, you also discussed the um, taking of funds out of the general fund as well. Right. I, the last sentence is, I believe that the use of fund balance as a revenue source will continue within the range of 13 to $19 million annually this occurred before the implementation of STAT and will, and I project it will continue. Thank you. Um, when the general fund surplus is appropriated, what requirements exist for how that money is to be spent? Um, do, is, does it have to go into certain budget subcategories? Uh, no. Okay, so, so uh, monies go in, um, there's no requirements on the subcategories, and when there are appropriated, it's, it's more like a slush fund. It can be used in any way. Not once it's appropriated into our budget. Once none of our revenues are matched to a specific expenditure. So we receive $700 million in county money and $600 million in state money, and all of those revenues essentially fund a small part or pro, pro rata portion of every project so there's no specific direction other than with one-time expenditures which are county funded so um so your basis for saying that status sustainable in the long run is based on the availability of those surplus funds and also the support for the program from our county executive and county council. I'm saying all sources of revenue are used for STAT, except in this year, I think uh, grant funding, I don't believe there's a specific portion of grant, federal grant or state grant funding that's uh, allocated to STAT. Um, now these lease contracts for the devices are four-year terms and since our county executive executive will be gone in 2018 that will only that will occur only one year into these contracts is that right what will occur the departure of the departure county of the executive county, of the current county executive will occur only one year into those four-year well, lease agreements. as i said the county executive 
and the county have funded two years of stat and we will be requesting two more funding years both of which will occur prior to his departure um, so long term really is not long term when you describe that we're only talking a year into this new lease that's not really a long-term picture regarding sustainability. Well, you got to remember that once a lease is undertaken, you know, all of the leases before have a run-out period. So it's, for instance, the lease that's approved this year will continue uh, 17, 18, 19, and 20. I don't okay, know if that's okay. your question and answer or not. What I'm getting at is that the support on the county level we don't really know what's going to happen after we get after 2018. I, I think what would help Ms. Miller's question is the way we have worked with county government, it will actually be sustained through maintenance of effort. So it is sustainable if it's mm -hmm. if it's actually calculated within maintenance of effort. So that of course would be in our case. Ca right. That would be the case then. Correct. Okay. Um, can you tell me with the an ever ever increasing focus on technology um, currently? Uh, what portion of the funding for STAT in this proposal specifically addresses issues of safety and technology? So things such as cyber safety, the ergonomics, the medical and health concerns that some people have brought up, the effects of extended screen time, protecting student data, et cetera. Protecting student data and security are ongoing uh, operations of the Department of Technology that are separate from the STAT budget. Um, in uh, the ergonomic aspects that have been discussed are not, uh, to my knowledge, incorporated in the fiscal so, so range of this program. So I think, what, Ms. Miller, what you're asking more so is our approach, not necessarily our budget, but our approach to how we're addressing cybersecurity, student safety, and other um, health factors of which you're, you're discussing, which I, I, we can definitely answer that for. I don't know if it's a budget well, discussion. Well, it would be budget want. because it would have to be but, supported in the budget. But those are, are internal operations of things we would do within current funds that we may not necessarily be requesting additional funds for. So for example, we can talk to you about what we do around common sense media, making sure that we teach our students you know, responsible use, what we're doing in terms of you know, the balance between screen time and, and things that are occurring in classrooms. I don't, and I know Mr. Saris is not the appropriate one for it. Um, we can definitely set up a time to where we address the board on how we're approaching those, but it's not, in my, my humble opinion, it's not a budget where we're requesting new dollars to do that work. Well, that's what my question was. Is there uh, any sort of appropriation being given to those kind of things in this proposal? So in this proposal, we're not requesting any new funding for that. Um, within our current budgets that we have, either through academics, meaning innovative learning, or through informational technology, we have systems in place to where we address students' responsible use and actually work in terms of professional development around appropriate uses and not appropriate uses of devices. Okay. Um, that is a, a major concern of mine, and I, I would like to actually make a motion regarding that. Um, it's not necessarily a budget item, like you say, but it, it affects how I would address other budget items. We, we currently have a motion on the floor that we need to resolve, or you can amend the motion that's currently on the floor. Um, actually, and I, I'm not... I'm not sure what the Robert's rules of order would be on this, but um, I'm asking that this motion come before that one because it would impact it. Well, we have a motion that's been seconded. We have to resolve that motion before we take on another motion. Okay, so you're saying the, the, the vote on the entire budget would come first? Right, unless... Or any motion to amend or, or anything else? Well, you can amend the mo you can move to amend the current motion to accept items uh, I accept M1. exhibit M1. You can move that that motion is on the floor. Okay, then I make a motion to amend the current motion 
to include that the board would direct uh, the following changes to the staff program. Uh, the first one would be requiring a, th a three year pilot for the lighthouse programs before any expansion can occur and that the lighthouse pilot programs would stay as currently defined. Uh, and the second element would be that uh, in the element on the elementary school level where the devices are in grades one to three next year that would move up with the current uh, the students that currently have them into grades two and four right there's a motion is there a second second uh, questions uh, regarding the amendment if not, I would ask Ms. Decker to call. Uh, now, also, I'm going to remind that Ms. Walia does not vote on these uh, budget issues. Um, but for clarity, I'm going to ask Ms. Uh, Decker to call the roll on the amended motion. Yeah, I don't okay. understand. Okay, go ahead. Um, actually, the Wi Fi is down, and so I don't have access to email or the board docs. Um, and uh, I believe there's. I have board docs. Wi Fi for have you tried Firefox? I, uh, I did not have it either. It's not here. Well, um, Mr. Yolf. Okay. Okay, so my, my point is that uh, Ms. Miller ha uh, had a table that talks about the uh, changes to stat. Um, if, if you could show that, because I don't, I don't have the spreadsheet there. Um, I can't show it. Well, I have it in here, but nobody's going to be able to see it, you know, and I can't, I haven't been able to email. Ms. Miller, do you I mind apologize. if uh, Mr. Yulfelder, he had a question sure. and, and we'll I, come yeah, back to um, you. Ms. Miller, I don't understand what you're, what you're saying. Um, what, what I do understand is that that apparently um, you want to amend the motion to put this budget forward to the county executive by <coughs> changing specific programs that are within the budget. Yes. What I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how you go about doing that. That. Um, doesn't make any sense to me I'm sorry okay Ms. Causey did you have a qu question well I was thinking uh, this is down and I was going to have it printed out I had the table with me but I thought you had it the table with you uh, to make it more clear to the fellow board members that at the uh, budget workshop that we had at the last meeting there were a number of board members that wanted to slow down stat until we had concrete data showing that it was effective for our students because the current uh, data that we have showing the difference between lighthouse schools in their park testing and non-lighthouse schools which um, shows that the lighthouse schools did not perform as well that's the only metrics th that we have um, so it would be prudent to not continue to spend all of this money in this dr you know, dramatic fashion until we get some actual results, not just qualitative, they're engaged, uh, we think they like it, um, we get little letters that say they want to keep them and all that, and that's wonderful. So there are ways that we can slow it down in terms of keeping the lighthouse schools intact, but not moving it forward into all of the other schools at the pace that was requested by Dr. Dance. So that would address that, the first point, which is uh, requiring a three-year pilot. Uh, and the second point more goes to the discussion about uh, how the focus should really be on getting the devices on the high school level and not so much with the youngest grades. So in moving the devices up with the kids that currently have them in grades one to three, we'd move them up next year to grades two to four. So the motion then would be to adjust the budget accordingly to these changes. All right. Um, again, Mr. Stewart, did you have a question or? I guess two things. In that, in that instance, 
those teachers and instructors who were at those levels will no longer be then using tablets or anything else going forward. Well, the teachers would still have them. All the teachers have them. But they would, their students would stop having them, in other words. Um, yep. For grade, for, ki for right. kindergarten, first grade. Well, I, I guess my comment would be more of a macro one, which is that although I might be open to discussion about how best to modify the rollout to ensure that we are monitoring progress in a way um, that's efficacious and maybe even allowing for another year of the study from Johns Hopkins. The environment in which we're in, it's, we only have one proposal to do so, and I'm not sure that I can sign on to that. So maybe there needs to be a larger discussion about what it should look like. All right, Ms. Johnson. So this is discussion time, right? Yes. OK. So at one point, I was pretty quiet, but I've got some things to say right now. So I don't feel it's appropriate to legislate instruction in this manner. Um, I was definitely one of the people that said we needed to slow down, but I think that it, that would be a detriment to our teachers. I was taking the teachers, uh, taking the students' um, opinions into consideration, and we did get little letters from the students, yes. but. Um, I'm going to actually read one of these little letters. I know you're curious about the use of STAT as a student. I would let, as a student, I would like to contribute to your discussion. I think that STAT is important for us as the learners. For example, I use dictionary.com to spell example. I was never good at spelling. I personally like using the devices for videos, learning videos. I feel that being able to go into brain pop and, and pause to take notes affects my grades in a more possible uh, positive way than if I were to sit on the rug and watch. I can't keep up. Please take my ideas into consideration. So I had been taking a lot of the students um, into consideration, and that's why I thought it would be OK to maybe slow down even in the high school level, kindergarten level, first grade level. And then I thought, on a macro level, that the teachers are affected. And so I reached out to a handful of teachers within the last 48 hours and got a, a, a lot of responses. And I'm going to read a few of them. The first grade students find the devices very motivating. And these are the students that we would be taking devices way, away from in the future um, with this proposal. When they use them, they are so wrapped up in their, tasks, their tasks. Dream Dreambox is super helpful with developing their individual math skills. They're able to work at their own level and pacing. Um, furthermore, our instruction focuses on activities that don't require use of the devices as well. Another teacher, this is a second grade teacher. I know the students find the devices engaging and motivating. Students are working at their own pace and level, and the, children's can, the children can use it for research and listen to stories to build uh, reading fluency and comprehension. However, daily instruction also focuses on activities that do not use the, the device. The children are busy reading and developing communication skills and interacting with, other, uh, with others, um, which is a very important skill. So um, back to my initial point is that I don't feel it's appropriate to legislate instruction this way. So as the chair of the curriculum committee, I am requesting um, that we get monthly updates on STAT, um, not just STAT, but Lighthouse. I think Mr. Bowler would be happy about that. Um, but Lighthouse schools as, all, um, as well. I'd like to get a better understanding as a member of this board and, and, as, a, and as a parent, as a member of the community, the, fix, the financial implications, the curriculum um, rollout, safety and security, as Ms. Miller mentioned. Um, I'd like to also get some suggestions and input from other board members um, within the curriculum committee. And um, so we can find improvements and, and, and ways to move forward with STAT. So it is um, all encompassing for the, for the county. And as a reminder to the public, the curriculum committee meetings are open to the public. So that was just my. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, I, I think uh, Marisol makes a lot of very good points, but I think Ann has a basic point as well. Um, of course, I advocated last year <clears throat> that we uh, create another 15 schools uh, to have a control group and, and not expand staff, not take it from anyone who had it, but to create another s a smaller group. But instead, we went completely and uh, we went off uh, the rails, I believe, by moving too quickly. Um, I'm completely supportive of, of um, technology is as part of our instructional program. And I, I had a very long and uh, interesting conversation with uh, Verlita just yesterday, as a matter of fact, on the subject. And it was also illuminating. You know, but it's just one illustration of, of the fact that I believe we're moving too quickly. Earlier, 
typical of my fashion and out of order during the, during the uh, contracts committee uh, meeting, I asked if we know how much time even the, our students are spending on an average day or any measure of time that they're spending. And no one in the audience of our staff could give me an answer. I mean, we don't even know how much screen time our students are spending on an average. There was no even, ha not even a hazard of a guess of in a six and a half hour school day of a, a range. There was, there was no idea or no willingness to express an idea at least. And again, that's not a criticism of our staff. I think our staff is wonderful, dedicated and hardworking. But I think it's just an il illustrative of we're, we're, we're moving too quickly. And I think it has budgetary implications because the odds are we're wasting a whole lot of money. But I don't know that because we just don't have enough information um, about, about STAT. So I, I, well, I'm not sure that, that um, Ann's proposal is, is necessarily the best way to, to slow down uh, the, the, the STAT program. Um, it would be a way of getting a much more accurate picture of what's going on. So I really, I'm really conflicted here, but uh, I'm just, as I was last year, as I continue to be, not opposed in any way, but just deeply concerned about the, the rapidity, or rather the speed with which we're, we're, we're implementing this. I, I think we're going way too fast, and I've said that many times. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Gillis, uh, you had a question. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to just say that the process that we use to address issues like this is usually, and in this instance, has been a three-step process. We had a public hearing. We vetted this same issue exhaustively at our last meeting. We had motion after motion, these same issues. And this meeting today was really to finalize the budget, which we discussed and voted on amendments to at the last meeting, and to revisit them again and to cause uh, there to be potential delay in delivery of the, the budget, which has been fully discussed and voted upon at the last meeting, uh, seems to me to um, miss the point of our process. And for that reason, I call the question. All right, there's been a motion to call the question. Is there a second? Second. Excuse oh, me, I didn't well, get no. a chance to make my comments. Well, so. he called for the question. So um, there's been discussion. He's calling for the question that's been second. We have to vote on whether we're going to vote on that uh, at this time. So we're going to vote on whether we're going to vote. Right. Or whether, so if we vote not to vote, then we can have more discussion? Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Decker, would you call the roll? Now we, we uh, have a motion to call for the question at this time. No. Mr. Collins. Uh, no. This is a very dangerous path to go down, colleagues. Be careful what you wish for. No. Mr. Gillis. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. Yofelder. Yes. Mr. Birch. Nay. Ms. Williams. Yes. Daniel. Yes. No, uh, no passes. Um, so if there's further discussion, Ms. Causey. Thank you. First of all, Mr. Gillis, to your point of we exhaustively discussed this at the last meeting, that's true that we did have we did have discussion about it, but we, as a board, could see that there were board members that did want to slow down STAT, and then we had the blizzard, which prohibited any additional meetings, networks are down, and so forth, in terms of having additional conversations. So as everyone dug out, and the board members were able to have discussions, and we uh, also got in another slew of uh, community input based on that budget workshop and hearing more fully the details and the program. Um, so I do think it's valid to have a discussion now. 
And I was also listening when um, Senator Collins was asking Ms. White about the time that the students spend on the devices. And uh, one of her things is saying that she's never seen them on it, um, definitely not half the day. Um, they can't give a ballpark. Um, and then Mr. Imbriali chimed in that time is limited, it's not the whole time. So I might proffer that we would, in not the Lighthouse schools, leave the Lighthouse schools moving forward as they are, um, but to have either a two to one or three to one ratio of the devices in the other grades that were going to have them as they moved forward as a way to um, understand, to do two things really, to limit the funds that we are obligating ourselves to for four more years. Each new device has a four-year lease that comes with it, but also to see if there's another alternative to that, to a one-to-one, -one, that could also provide benefits to our students where they have access to technology for those teachers that have incorporated, and I understand your point, Marisol, about the teachers that have used uh, the devices and they've incorporated them into their lessons to still have that available. But as we heard um, Senator Collins and I and those other people that were in the room for the um, contracts committee meeting, that they're not using them all day. So it's a very expensive device. So this is a way that we could both carry forward what the teachers have done, but not add to the expense until we start to see some results and find out what is actually effective, necessary, um, for our students, but also to carry forward. Because one of the things that we continue to hear is all of the other needs that our community has, and this is uh, literally taking money away from many, many other areas. It's the only way it fits into the maintenance of effort that Dr. Dallas was talking about, is to take it away from other programs, the transportation, the special needs, um, you know, so on and so forth. So um, that's what I would, that's my point of discussion is that it is a way to slow it down. It doesn't take it out of the hands of anyone that's used it in terms of the teachers and the students, but it does slow it down. Mr. Collins. I, I really want to vote for uh, Ann's amendment um, because I feel so strongly about, about uh, slowing it down. And as a matter of fact, I told Ann that I would. And um, I'm very careful having spent a career uh, having people ask me to promise to vote a particular way when I was in the legislature. And it's very dangerous when you commit your vote, and it's a really a very serious uh, sin to not keep your word. But, Ann, I'm going to publicly say to you tonight, I'm not going to keep my word to you to vote for your amendment because um, my seatmate Marisol made a, made a, um, a, a powerful argument. Um, I think it's clear that there are some members, I don't think it's a majority, that there are some members on the board that are really concerned about the speed of, of, of the rollout of, of STAT. I know we've all con uh, conveyed it personally to the superintendent. I know I have and I know you have. We've both had meetings publicly. I mean, I've said it for the last couple of years and uh, um, I say everything about 10 or 15 times a meeting, so I'm sure everyone's uh, either turned me off completely or heard me say it. But, but, we, but we really shouldn't be using the budget. I mean, I'm ready to vote on the budget. I think the attempt to cut off, to cut off debate was outrageous, and we should not ever do that. Uh, we should never attempt to cut each other off. And I hope you will, those of you who voted for that will not do it again. But um, that is a personal point of view, which I've had and expressed very clearly to the chair from time to time, regardless of who he was when they attempted to do that to me when I was saying something in, in one of our meetings here. But I, I am prepared to vote on this budget, vote for this budget. We did add three, what I thought were very important amendments. Marisol's, of course, for the $10 million was the, was the big surprise one, but the, the other two for uh, additional employees uh, in two key areas of great need, I think, were also very important, and we added those. So, so while I'm deeply sympathetic to slowing down uh, STAT, I think the idea you have, Anne, is, is, is very um, worthy of a great deal of, 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 ex of examination, and I think we should ask the Curriculum Committee to examine it, and we should think we should ask Dr. Dance to examine it, and um, I know his passion of moving forward as quickly and, and rapidly as possible, but um, and, and um, you know, 
that's, that's my passion too. I want the children to have this accessibility, but I just am deeply concerned that we don't know what the heck we're doing and we're too impatient to wait for some compelling data, which is why I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but I am ready to vote on the budget, so I, I hope that we can do that pretty soon. Mr. Yulfelder. You know, this is a very complex uh, situation relative to technology. I think this week the uh, president uh, committed $4 billion for technology. Um, I want to quote uh, a line that was in the New York Times article last year. Um, if you don't embrace technology today, you will next year. And I think what it tells us is that technology and the method in which we teach our kids is moving. And technology moves rapidly, very rapidly. But there is another side to this, and even when I heard the, the uh, folks from Hopkins, there's another side to this that I don't think that you will be able to evaluate uh, the lighthouse schools to other schools, and that's the behavior. And I've talked to several principals who have pointed out to me that there's a dramatic change in the behavior of the children uh, who have their devices. And um, at the same time, uh, to deny uh, the rest of the kids uh, th this opportunity uh, to further their education, uh, I think is wrong. Um, I don't believe that the method that you want to use by creating some additional um, legs to the, to the budget process is the way to go. If we want to discuss this and examine this, I think we ought to take the time to really understand what technology is bringing to us. And uh, when I hear slow down, I don't know what the definition of slow down is. Is it uh, six months, one, one month, six years, four years? And, you know, no one has anything definitive about the word slow down. Don't I'm you interrupt tell you, me. David. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> well, I know you know everything, so I'm sure you can tell me. <laughs> anyway, I, I think we ought to proceed ahead with, with either uh, forwarding the budget or not forwarding the budget. And then I also think that we ought to put on the agenda uh, for some discussion. Uh, is, there, is STAT moving too fast, too slow? Uh, what are the benefits? And their, their benefits, as I said, are more than just uh, comparing the lighthouse schools uh, to schools who do not have uh, devices and so forth. There's other factors, a lot of intrinsic values that we have to recognize. It's not a simple task. It's a difficult task. Okay. Uh, I would like to proceed ahead with the budget. Ms. Miller? We're talking about a $1.8 billion budget, and I think it warrants us spending a little bit of time here. Um, and, and I, too, have an answer to what is slow down. Slow down means wait until we have evidence that it makes sense to move forward. Now, we don't get any results from Johns Hopkins until year three. So my motion to require a three-year pilot is in line with that. Um, your other point, Mr. Yulfelder, about depriving some students, uh, because we don't have results, we can't really say who's getting deprived and who's not. Are we depriving the kids by giving it to them? Or are we p depriving the kids by not giving it to them? We don't know the answer to that yet. So we can't use that as a rationale for moving forward. Um, I would amend my motion to well, eliminate we, the we second. We have to vote on the original. We haven't voted on your original amendment first. If, before okay, we change I, it again. But I can amend my own motion, correct? No. She can withdraw the motion, I guess, right? No, I mean, as long as the second agrees to the okay. friendly amendment, you can amend the amendment as long as the second agrees to it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I would amend it to take away that second point, which was to move the um, devices up by a grade. 
and just have the motion be to require a three-year pilot. Can I ask a question? Um, well, we need a second first. Uh, no. Second. Okay, now is there a discussion about the uh, amendment? Can someone explain? So the process as it stands is there's a two-year pilot and it has to come back to the board after the second year for approval anyway for more for additional funds? Not to my knowledge. So, uh, so we I, have lighthouse schools and we have all other schools in uh, a, a planned stage so that um, so, I don't so George, think. let me help you out yeah. um, with this one. If I'm hearing the question correctly, um, if the board were to approve the budget as is currently proposed, any additional schools added or grades added would have to come back to this board for further approval because it would be linked to budget. So if the board approves this budget and it's funded by the county, this will be for the 16-17 school year. Anything we would want to do or would like to do for 17-18 would come back to this board for approval because it would require additional dollars. So if we get the Johns Hopkins report and it's not the way the board wants to see it, but want, wants it to look like and the results don't aren't what we want to see, we can Delay. We can change it. We next can year. change next year. Or modify. Or modify, right. right. Once if the board would approve the budget as it is tonight, and again I'm just trying to understand the, the questions that are on the table. If the board approves the budget as it is tonight, we're gonna forward it to the county executive. He then has the autonomy to either add to the budget or cut from it. I mean um, moving forward, years moving forward. For 17, absolutely. For 17, 18 going forward, if the board, board wanted to go in a whatever direction, whether add to or whatever, they would have that autonomy, yes, because I'd have to bring a budget proposal back to this board for approval. I have a question for Dr. Dance. So if we approve the budget tonight as it stands, but as a board we were able to come to at another time to uh, <clears throat> move things along as they say. If uh, the board did decide that we wanted to slow stat by having uh, two to one in non-lighthouse schools as opposed to one to one, keeping the lighthouse schools the same, is there an opportunity to do that before the final budget is approved in, in the county council and then it comes back to us in May? So I would probably answer that in a different way, Ms. Causey. If the board wanted to go anything other than one to one, the board needs to look at a strategic plan. And if the board wanted to alter its strategic plan, which is what I drive the budgets based on, then I that would be the direction of the budgets based on the strategic plan. But and the, the board can look at the strategic plan at any any moment. Um, but my requests going forward with it being a one-to-one -one environment for grades one through twelve are based on the current strategic plan that's written. Um, if you're asking me in terms of the budget, once it's sent over to the county executive, it does not come back to this board until it goes through council. But but Dallas, uh, am I correct? If subsequently, just before next school year, if the board changed its policy, did what you said, we already have the budget, but that would just mean a heck of a lot of money is left over at the end of the, end of the fiscal year. That, that pot of unspent money, if we all of a sudden magically changed the strategic plan and said, okay, uh, so, so let me be clear, I don't, I don't think the board's gonna have an extra pot of money left over. No, no, what I'm saying, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying okay. to make it be, be funny. If, if the board <laughs> changed, I'm it. if the board changed staff for the next school year after the budget was approved, all that money would be coming into the pot that George was talking about from the county. Isn't that right, George? N no, sir. We, you're asking for $14.5 million for staff. If yeah. the board decides to say they're not doing that, the board we would not be able then to say we're going to reallocate that money elsewhere. We're sending it over to the county under a line item for stat. Well, I thought George said all the money comes. But in our county request, we're asking for additional funding. If you go back to the work session document that we put in front of you, sort of with all the new requests, yeah. that specifically 14 and a half is asking just for stat. If the board decides. Oh, no, we're going to spend at least 14 and a half on stat, but we might not spend the whole whole amount on stats. I mean, this is not likely to occur, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand uh, because I was, um, you know, I was, I was interested in what George said about all the money comes in from the state and from the county, and it doesn't get to come in for... True in terms of revenue source, but when we're yeah. asking for the county to fund, we're going to be asking to fund specifically for a line item. Correct. But so just because the money's in our 
general fund, we can't just move money around with that. We're asking the county special permission for an X amount of dollars for a specific initiative. I understand that. But, it, but if it wasn't spent for some reason, then at the end of the fiscal year, where does it go? If we don't spend our, our allocated budget within a fiscal year, it goes to our fund balance, but that still has to be reallocated to us through the county. So even though it's in our fund balance, doesn't mean we can spend well, it. The county would have to give us permission. Yeah, yes. well, that's what, that's what I thought. Okay. okay. Mr. Birch, uh, Mr. There, Birch uh, has a there's, question. Just to finish here, there is a process by which the board can ask the county to reallocate funds, and it was done last year, and it's been so, done so there, before. So there is a process to reallocate mm -hmm. funds if the board decided to change the strategy so that we don't have all the schools exactly like the Lighthouse schools. Then so we could specific. reallocate the funds, for instance, for instructional teachers or special ed teachers or so forth. We could redirect those funds. I think what Ms. Causey's talking about, there have been times we've gone back to the county with a supplemental appropriation based on something that may have come up. For example, if we've received a grant that we have to get county council approved, we've gone as a supplemental appropriation. Um, that is not necessarily guaranteed, um, but we are asking for their permission to basically move money throughout the budget at that point, yes. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a question and then I um, perhaps have a, a suggestion as to how we ought to proceed. As I heard it just a few moments ago, uh, we do have Hopkins that will be reporting back to us with some information at some date. I see the, uh, I see the, the current superintendent nodding. And what date is that? Um, I don't have the, I'm looking at you now. Dr. Brown, we can put that in this week's update to the board. I mean, is it like within, a, within 12 months? Is it within oh, yes, sir. Fine, yes, sir. fine, excellent. Here's where I'm going with this. And this is not my quote, um, you know, Truth is what you can verify, what you can validate, what you can assimilate. And if you can't verify, validate, or assimilate, then it's not truth. It's false. That's not my quote. It's, I think, William James. We're really stuck in the middle right now with STAT. And we have our leases. We have the budget before us. My sense is if there was a, if there was a means by which the continued process of STAT was to be revisited based on the Hopkins information, because we can't assume that the Hopkins information, assuming it is valid, assuming that it is uh, credible, it is honest, it was done, you know, correctly, we can't assume that it's going to say STAT is bad or that STAT is good. That's right. Although I do want to thank all the parents and uh, all the, uh, the teachers and with some other board members I spent, you know, the better part of three hours last week with 15 teachers, some of whom are retired, uh, some of whom are still active in our system, all of whom love the system but want, you know, only the best for students and STAT causes a great concern. So that being said, uh, perhaps the way to proceed is twofold. One, the budget's approved. Secondly. David Uelfelter, back from Hawaii, has suggested that we actually set aside a time to review and discuss that, perhaps in advance of Hopkins reporting to us what they've been able to measure or not measure with regard to STAT. We then digest that. We then meet to discuss the results of that. That then tells us where to go in the future with regard to STAT. We then have information, and William James, who's been dead for 110 years, would be 105 years, would be proud that we're proceeding in this fashion because we're attempting to validate what is true and what is not. And we're trying to do it in a way that's fiscally responsible because, let's face it, you don't rent a car to park it in the garage. So if kids, and our chief academic officer can't tell us how much time kids are spending with these devices, I suspect they're picking and choosing between the different mediums, but I don't know because I'm not conducting the Hopkins analysis. So that being said, if we're going to put this money into this, we want the devices to be used in a helpful, productive, educational way. That's how I suggest we proceed. Now, whether that means these other amendments out there have to be voted on and disapproved, I'm suggesting this is a way to get us through, get our budget to what it has to get to this year, and then make sure that we are the healthily skeptical board that we were sent here to be, and then we're proceeding in a very efficacious way. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller. We don't have to vote on the budget today, or we don't have to approve it today. We've got another meeting this month. It doesn't have to be approved until the end of the month. Is that correct? That's correct, before March um, 1st. So that's another option, is a, a slight delay to, to hash out some of these issues 
I think that we've all expressed a lot of concerns about the implementation of STAT, the lack of, you know, any uh, evidence, the speed, the amount of money, the way it ties us in, and we're not going to be able to roll it back easily. Um, so the other option is to vote against the budget today, and we can vote on, vote on it again at the next meeting. Is there any uh, further discussion? Um, I, have, I have one quick question for Mr. Saris. Is that okay? Yes. Um, Mr. Saris, in the um, budget county, I mean the board proposed budget, it has the um, auditor and administrative assistant and the 10 million for school air conditioning and the benefits for the two positions in its own column. But then as I add it up, it does fit into the total of all funds so that we're not so those three things are not outside of what we're expecting to get from revenues. So revenues are matching expenses. Is that right. correct? Yeah. Okay. So with revenues matching expenses, there's no reason that we would expect the county or the county executive to have to cut those three things that we added because they do fit within the budget. Well, we're asking, yeah, we're asking the other side of this equation is on the preceding page. Um, if you see under revenue, local superscript one, that $10.2 million is being requested from county funding. So, um, you know, we don't know whether they're, they are gonna have those dollars available or not, so. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we have the, uh, I would ask, that Ms. Decker, could you read the amended motion back? Uh, yes. Would, Ms. Miller, I would, if I could ask you to restate it just. A three-year pilot shall be required for all Lighthouse programs before expansion can occur. All right, and Ms. Causey, you second that motion? Second. All right. Uh, we have a motion that's been seconded. I would ask Ms. Decker to call the roll. We're voting on the amendment at this time to. Yes. No. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Gillis? No. Ms. Johnson? No. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Stewart? No. Mr. Yulfelder? No. Mr. Birch? Nay. Ms. Williams? No. Mr. McDaniels? No. Okay, so the amendment doesn't carry. Now we go back to the original motion to accept uh, Exhibit M1. Uh, would you please call the roll for that? No, I feel that we can make better use of these dollars and um, I would hope that we can have a majority vote no so then we can discuss and bring it back next week. Collins? Yes. No. Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Miller? No. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Yolfelder? Yes. Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. Mr. McDaniels? Yes. So the motion carries to approve the operating budget. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Our next agenda item is uh, personnel matters. I ask Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve exhibits N1 and N5 through N5? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Dr. Dance, uh, I'm calling on you for the administrative appointments. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal at Lansdowne High School and Coordinator in the Office of Organizational Development. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit O? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to introduce uh, two new, uh, new individuals to their position, but not new uh, to our school system. First is for the assistant principal position at Lansdowne High School, currently right now an English teacher at Lansdowne High School, and that's Catherine Smith. <laughs> Catherine, I know Mr. Miller is extremely excited. Um, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Uh, congratulations to both of you. Next is for the coordinator in the Office of Organizational Development, currently right now a supervisor of leadership development in that same office, and that's Kim McMiniman. Kim, I know Bill is excited, so other than Billy and Christina, do, what other family and friends do you have tonight? Congratulations, Kim, we're proud of you. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, our next ag agenda item is new business, uh, contract awards. At this time, I'll talk to, turn it over to Mr. Gillis. Thank you. Earlier this morning, uh, this morning, it seems like this morning, <laughs> earlier this <laughs> afternoon, the contracts committee met and we bring to you um, items one through three, uh, which were uh, recommended for your approval. And item four, which had of the four members a two to two vote, so there's no recommendation. All right, um, let me start uh, by asking if I have a motion to approve items P1 through pre P3. Mr. Chairman, I would like to comment about uh, MBU 50916. I think that may be uh, item three. Okay. Um, I'd like to separate out uh, JMI 60516. Which item? That's it? number four. That's so number four. Yeah, we're, we're separating that one. Great, right. thank you. Um, so let me think. Let me get a motion um, to uh, approve Mr. Virch, and then we'll discuss the item you would like. Is that okay? That works fine. My comments are right. very brief. Um, do I have a motion to uh, approve items P1 through P3? Well, except I got a comment on three. Which I believe is the. Uh, yeah, he wanted a motion and then the discussion. Wow. So, yeah, okay. Is there a motion? I'll, I'll so make the motion. I'll okay. Second too. Now, there's some discussion. Uh, go, go ahead, Mr. Birch. Uh, with regard to Chase Elementary School air conditioning, I just wanted to verify that this is actually phase two of air conditioning at Chase Elementary School. Is that correct? Well, I don't know what was. Phase one was the electrical upgrade. It correct. The reason why I asked is because I was actually there. I was there with Tara Wilkins, the principal, walked through that school. I think even the fact that the deputy superintendent was with us when we did. Um, it was a hot day. And I could actually see the, the work being done outside, and I'm glad to see that the system is following through and going in with phase two. Uh, and it's not an inconsiderable sum that's being spent on Chase Elementary School. Um, the way I look at it, it's like uh, $2.5 million plus. That's right. Um, you know, as the elected board, uh, as the non-elected board member, the appointed board member from our sixth district, um, I think this is a this is a good, necessary improvement. Uh, I know that it'll be certainly welcomed by the parents and the children and the staff in that school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've had a um, motion and a. We don't need a second, I guess. All those in favor of approving items P1 through P3, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So it carries uh, P1 to P3. And I know we'll have some discussion. We'll just have some general discussion on yeah, item P4. Sure. The, um, 
this was a matter that came before the board last last meeting and mr saris presented it then uh, the the contracts committee had a substantial discussion about it earlier today uh, mr saris i don't know whether you want to uh, frame the issue again uh, yeah i think the only issue that i wanted to mention was the pricing information on the projector itself because the total um, proposal uh, of over $4,400 includes a variety of services, installation, electric cable, warranty, uh, service, um, project management, training, et cetera. So, uh, but the question came up about the specific projector itself and the cost of that. Um, Lions Mill Elementary uh, was uh, equipped with Epson uh, projectors. Um, the price that we paid uh, was um, the manufacturer's suggested retail price of $1,399. Um, the price for the box light projector that is included in this contract is, um, let's see here, we're, oh, $1,699. And so that would be an additional uh, $300. Um, we talked about the fact that the box light proposal includes replacement bulbs, which, uh, under our Epson uh, contract, we purchase, uh, in, typically over the course of four years, we would, might purchase two bulbs based on the projected life. So um, the manufacturer's suggested price there is about $220 per bulb. So to try and make it an apples to apples comparison, it would be about $1,839 versus uh, 1699 give or take, depending on whether you use one bulb or two. So I think they're fairly comparably priced, and I just wanted to make sure that we were looking at that underlying piece of information as part of that larger discussion. Okay, thank you. There are other questions from Mr. Saris regarding the projectors? <coughs> Mr. Collins? Georgia. Would you explain to the full board uh, my suggestion that we make this a one-year contract? Um, yeah, um, that is something that if the board directed us to do, uh, we believe that we have the uh, the leeway within the terms of the proposal to do so. So, so explain explain how I vote on this. So, then. well, I, I think, and I don't know, in my experience, my brief experience with contracts committee, um, I believe we would have to amend this exhibit because the current exhibit provides uh, for a uh, a term of four years and four months, and we would need to also. Um, align the spending authority uh, with the term, um, which I think would have to be at least one year, um, and uh, proceed on that basis to um, amend the resulting contract with the vendor accordingly. I don't think we have to amend the contract. I think we have to amend this exhibit and then vote on that uh, amendment. Okay. Uh, I, I think I understand it, but I don't think I could explain it. Uh, that's why I asked George to do it. Uh, <laughs> once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just think that um, we ought to, before we make the, these larger, very, very large commitments, that we should, uh, that we should, you know, try it out for a year. The only uh, comment that staff made at the Contracts Committee um, uh, Lloyd suggested that it might be a little more costly if you only do it for a year. Um, I, I, uh, I don't really believe that because 
I know how competition would work, and I know how the yeah, how, uh, how the the uh, complex, uh, as I refer to it, the technology educational complex, are so um, aggressively pursuing contracts for for the opportunity to get into this county, the 25th largest school system in the United States. They'd be very amenable to giving it a one-year shot, and I just think it would be a wiser decision for us to do it in that fashion. Um, I don't want to slow this program down. I, I don't want, I, but I just think we should take a look at it and let and um, whoever's uh, on the board next year uh, have the opportunity to, to see if they want to go full bore with a lar larger contract. So um, I would uh, make the motion that we we make it that kind of a contract and ask uh, George and company to, to do those things to make it that type of a contract and either bring it back to us at the next meeting for a vote um, that will give us still give us plenty of time. So I, I would press that motion. Um, and I, I know some other board members. I, I was just going to follow up. I also heard the conversation earlier um, that when Mr. Collins asked a question about um, um, requesting for, uh, quotes for one year versus four years, and we really don't know if there's any additional expense at all, and we could imagine that there would be some, but it would be a good piece of information, I think, for the board to have. You know, if we go out and we find out it's extremely more expensive, but I think, in my opinion, the effort to do that would be a good piece of information for the board. Well, uh, let, um, could I just interject? Um, we're getting advantage by, you know, as with STAT, we only, exercise one annual lease at a time. So um, we've got the benefit of the multi-year pricing already built into this RFP. And um, I, so in that sense, we're not, we're not gonna rebid this proposal. We have a bid that's, ex uh, that's acceptable and we can use the pricing that's provided for in this uh, proposal. And as with any of these uh, contracts, we only go one year at a time. Um, so, so we can, we're, we're using the, we're getting the benefit of this, the pricing that we've talked about. So, we so do, my we, concern is if we went out and rebid it using basically the same criteria that we would have some legal challenges from the vendors who all made a very substantial effort to put together proposals through a multi-tier process. So we would really have to dramatically change the scope if we were to rebid it, but we can go forward under the terms we have in front of us. And do what I ask you to do and make it a one year. Yes. Under the terms we have before us. I mean, I certainly yeah. don't want to screw up the program. So, but but I well, just. Like this is a four-year lease, so it'd be. I, I, I understand I, that, but I. Exercise our option to get out after one year is what you can say. I think right, you're saying. So, yeah, but well, well, George, let me ask you this. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm barking up a tree that doesn't make any sense. Does what I'm suggesting, given, given my concerns about the, uh, that I have of, of committing uh, when I see a, a a $41 million price tag, and I'd prefer to see a $10 million price tag uh, for this year. Um, am I, is that a distinction without a difference, are you saying? Yeah, um, right, we would have that appropriation and that, I mean, that spending authority, we don't have the money yet. So, so, so but, we, but we're asking for the spending authority if, for instance, if you wanted to say one year um, and $10 million, we would, if we executed a lease, um, and the lease portion of that was, you know, the the annual portion was two and a half million. We would acquire ten million dollars worth of equipment and pay it off at two and a half million dollars a year for four years. And then, if we wanted to go to year two, three, or f four for an additional amount of equipment, we could do that also subsequently. So yes, you can give us this authority, the $10 million, and um, we can exercise it under a lease that would go out 
two and a half million a year for four years. And we would accomplish the same purpose for next year for our schools and for the children. We would be able to do phase one of four, correct? Okay. Well, that's uh, that. That's what I would like to propose, uh, because I think it's uh, it's a more prudent way to start some of these new things, uh, and and it might it might result in the next year's board looking at it a little more closely again, and we'll have something to measure it by and say how good it was. So I don't see any downside then, as you just explained it. So I think that I think that the motion, given my objective uh, of reducing that number, uh, for is, is very is very useful and good policy. So I would I would hope that we can adopt that. Okay, uh, Ms. Causey and then Mr. Stewart. Um, in building and contracts committee, um, I went over some information um, that I'll just try and quickly review. But Senator Collins, to your point, to do just one year of this is not is not sufficient in my mind. My motion then and my motion now would be to put this back out to RFP. RFP but to do it one year at a time and to also allow other vendors uh, the opportunity to rebid because what this, what this contract actually is, is this administration going for the brightest, the shiniest, the newest, the most expensive thing. So it would be a more expensive projector, a more expensive bulb than what we're using it at uh, Lions Mills. I understand those bulbs are actually $90. Um, and when there are schools in our system that have children being taught in closets that don't have water that their parents want them to drink. So again, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the philosophy that we have money for the shiny new things for starting out with uh, the first rollout is going to be seven of the ten schools or lighthouse schools. So, um, and then the other schools are gonna be left with less because we're continuing with the philosophy of letting them buy the shiniest, newest, most expensive thing, as opposed to what we currently have working at Lions Mills, which is a brand new school with a brand new system, um, which is working well. They're also uh, proposing a brand that has less than 4% of the market share. And Epson has 68.9% of the market share. So they've had projects before where they've had um, projectors discontinued after one year. So for technology to map out these four-year projects with the newest technology, the shiniest thing, is number one expensive, uh, more so than it needs to be. The other thing is the sound management program is, is lumped in and not extra. And I can tell you from talking to teachers, their classrooms aren't big enough to warrant four speakers and the teacher walking around with a wireless um, head microphone on. Um, so it's not just the one year. It's setting the tone for how we're going to move forward spending Good. money. And after hearing week, I mean, meeting after meeting and email after email from our parents and um, teachers anonymously and other stakeholders, taxpayers, that we don't need this to provide the instructional uh, benefits. We don't need the newest, shiniest technology all the time. So my motion would be to send it back out to RFP, okay, RFP let me first of all for just, one year at a time. Let me first and of all just, be a four -year Kathleen, lease. Kathleen Wolf, let me just withdraw my motion and, and uh, then the, the chair can open it up for, for, for other motions because I, I, I like yours better. <laughs> Thank hey, you. Uh, Mr. Stewart and then Mr. Yulfelder. Well, my question originally before Mr. Collins withdrew his motion was whether that particular idea would change our rights under the contract at all. It seems as though we still retained the right to terminate after a year and not move forward. So our authority would still have to be renewed each year, and we'd have that ability if we deemed it necessary and found that the progress of this or the efficacy of this program was wanting that we could terminate. Okay, let me make sure I understand. So under the current proposal, you're asking if we can re, uh, extend, uh, go back and add to our authority on an annual basis? Is that correct? Or my, No. My understanding was that Mr. Collins was suggesting that we make this a single year contract, and as of right now it stands at a four year contract. May I, may um, I just I, yeah. Jump in. I think there's yep. a series of four contracts. Each one is four years, a, a four year lease. So it would be, it would stage out a four year lease every year over the course of time. 
So the Mr. Collins's motion before he withdrew it was to have a one one contract that was a four year lease. But he's withdrawn that and Ms. Causey, I think, says let's just lease some projectors for one year. I think that's what No, I'm saying to send to not vote for this contract, to send it back to RFP for one year of a four year lease but open it back up to the vendors to see if we can get the same functionality, which I know we can because we already have it at Lions Mills, for less money so that we can have more money to allocate to other things in our county where we hear constantly what the needs are. And I'm concerned that it will encourage uh, pro formal protests and litigation unless we substantially change the terms of the RFP and the scope of the project because you have vendors who in good faith uh, made a proposal and I don't see anything out there apart from maybe the price of a light bulb that you have pointed out is a significant difference in the price of the projector and we haven't gotten into talking about functionality, warranties and other items. So I just want to caution everybody not to go down a path that's going to lead to legal complications, okay? Well, I think every vendor knows that it's pending board approval. And if the board doesn't approve it, the board doesn't approve it. The other issue is to have the sound management system it's set true. off separately because that is not necessary for but every classroom in this county. You can't, it, you're going to have to substantially change the terms of the RFP more than just by the number of years or, um, uh, so this is, this is where I sort of add um, a comment here. Um, traditionally, it's been the practice of the system to purchase technology. Um, technology, particularly projectors, have a life cycle of four or five years, and then we're trying to figure out what we're doing with that technology, and we're trying to purchase additional. Um, when the RFP was written um, for this by George and your department, it was to lease, knowing that at the end of that lease cycle, you would refresh your technology. Um, I would be very, I would, I would just caution the board that when we develop tech specs with academics and IT at the table, it's geared on what professionals and academics have done working with our teachers and working with our principals of what classrooms may need. So if the board is saying that, you know, I just would be very cautious when we, I, I would say we probably would want to say to the curriculum committee, um, you know, how do we make sure that every single classroom has X specs, which was sort of designed that way and then to figure out how might we procure basically what academics and what our schools are saying they may need and want, right? But I think the fundamental difference of what Ms. Causey is saying is that in Lyons Mill we actually purchased equipment. But in this particular case we're actually changing our philosophy of saying we're going to be leasing over a four year cycle. Um, but in every single contract that you guys have, Margaret Ann and, um, you know, I'm sorry I'm calling you out. Marianne, but uh, we actually have opportunities in the contract to where if the board gave spending authority right now, that is not saying that we're going to automatically execute year two or year three of that contract, right? All we're asking for is purchasing authority now to start the work of phase one. So in terms of what you're saying, uh, Mr. Stewart, is that when phase two comes around, that's a new lease that we would have to do. We don't have to say we're going to obligationally go into that lease. Uh, I, I, Mr. Chairman? Well, uh, I think Mr. Yolfelder, and okay. then I'll come around. Okay. Uh, for, for maybe some of us, logistically, logistically, I'm not sure I understand. So, how many uh, instructional spaces do we now have projectors in? Well, we we currently have about 6,100, and we've priced this out at 6,900 so, so, over the four-year so, term. So, this 6,900 will replace what we presently have, is that correct? Is am I right? More or less? I mean, we, we don't have more. projectors in every classroom right now. We don't. No. Okay, we so do not. I, we the way I'm looking at this, that we're saying we want a projector in every classroom. Correct. In okay. every in all 6,900 classrooms. So yes. what you're saying is that the first phase, we're only going to get 25 percent of the 6,900 installed in the first year. Or are you going to get all 6,900 in the first no, year? No, you're only doing uh, the it. first proposal is 450 classrooms for the first year. Okay. That's then the second year is 2,000 classrooms. And now we, we're still, that's 2,400 and we got 6,900. 
So somebody's going to wait to year four before four they get a projection. Yes, sir. It is a four-year contract. Four okay. year you, know, you know, this is really not a lease. It's a lease purchase. You own it at the end of four years, so just a fancy way of financing, that's all. I mean, but you have the ability to, to move and refresh that technology versus it being in the uh, inventory. Ex explain that to me. Let's go through the first year. We install 450 in year one. And then in four years after we pay it off, we have the option to either renew it back to the leasing company and go to another contract and get newer uh, newer projectors at that point. So what happens, to the, old, what happens to the old ones? Because they all become, it can go to fair market value at that point. It, it says it goes to the, on, becomes the property of BCPS. It can become the property well, if we does. It says it does. Okay. At the end of the lease period, all hardware becomes the property of BCPS. Yes. So now we have. Now we own it. Yes. Now we own it. So if we wanted to, if that's the useful life, four years, and we had to take those out, then we'd have to buy new ones or we'd lease new, new ones. Yes. So we're, we're doing a four-year purchase of some equipment? Yes. Okay. I just want to get clear on this. So you're saying 450 the first year, two, 2000 the second year. What happens to year three and four? Still be 2000 each every year. 2000 each. Okay. That doesn't get you to 69, but that's okay. Oh, it's it's not a math class. 6450. <coughs> it's close. Mr. Right. Collins. So, okay. Lloyd, Lloyd. Let, me, let me digest. Go ahead. Let me digest this now. Are you finished, David? Yeah, I'm trying to digest I mean, yeah, okay. what we're doing. So now, so now we're down to 6450. How many classrooms now have projectors? Well, all of our new construction and renovated classrooms have it. And then uh, I would say right now we're sitting around just under 900 classrooms. Okay, so, so right now we have 900 classrooms that have a system like this or not not as sophisticated no, as this that's no, close to 10 years old what we have is 10 years old except for the new renovation <laughs> classrooms and new construction <laughs> what we're saying here we're only going to keep we only want, we only want to use it for four years yeah we're replacing equipment that has been installed over the last 15 years yeah but i'm going a lot of what, classrooms. back to what david was reading here and what you just said, at the end of the four years, we're going to start over again and, and get correct get Current, new ones again. If we go with this contract, we get on a four-year recycle plan for projectors. So four we years have not from, had that in the past in so, this district. So four years from now, you're going to come to the board, whoever's here, who's ever running the show, who's ever's in your job and Dallas's job and all the board members' jobs are going to have another $41 million contract. That for is, we projectors. are going to replace four, 400 and we're only replacing the first year. We're replacing the first 450. Yeah, but he said in four years from now. Yeah, we're replacing the first get 450. 450. Yeah, but, but four years from now, you'll come back for $41 million authority again, or maybe by that yeah. time it'll be $50 million. Yep. I find it hard to believe that you only got a four year life out of a projector. I mean, I, I guess if that's the. If that's well, what the it fact is. is, we don't, though, David. If, if the stuff we're using now is 10 years old, he said. I, this is. I don't get uh, this. I, just, I mean, I just don't get it. Does my motion stand? Mine's not. Mine's now, gone. Uh, yeah, would you? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask Mr. Virch had a question, sure. and then we'll um, come back to your motion. The four year leases, each year, well, let's put it this way there's an overall contract, which is what is before the board. In that contract, it is contemplated that over the following four years, there would be a number of leases entered into by the board. Each one of those leases would be four years in length. Is that correct? Correct. So actually, what the board would do tonight would tack on four years at the end of the fourth year. So actually, this is projecting the spending for eight years. Unless what you've told me is that each lease is a year and not a four-year lease. Well, each lease is executed in a year. We take delivery of all that equipment in that year, and then have we have a, it for four years. We have a four-year. The next year, year the same thing. The next right. year, the same thing. In the last year, the same thing again. So that's another four years on, four years out from here. So it's actually we're talking about something eight years down the road. But we don't have to proceed with we that. I understand. Right. I hear you. But there's a separate distinction there because there's a, an extension 
contemplated. So, Nick, what, I, what I'm trying to get to here is we have an overall contract right now. It has an extension component to it, but within this original contract, there are four years in which there will be four leases, each executed for a four-year period. So, Nick, whether we renew or we don't renew, the fact is we still have four more years on the last on the, on the fourth year lease. Right. So what we're doing tonight is extending for another eight years. Right, but Steve, I, I might be mistaken, hey, okay, but my please. understanding was that as this rolls out into additional classrooms in year two and three, that we wouldn't have to go to year four, for example, if we determined after year two or year three that this is a bad investment that we don't want to proceed. Correct, but the prior leases, they still continue to run even right. if we elect to pull out of that contract. I'm with you. Yep. So, so the exactly. So where, where I think we're at is either we like this approach, and believe me, we got to have technology in schools. The superintendent's dead on. We've been buying technology. <laughs> it may have been a black and white TV set when I was in school, but it's technology, and we continue to do it, and we will have to do it into the future. The question is whether this vehicle, as designed, is the vehicle we should be using. I think we should actually rebid it. I don't think we're going to be in trouble legally, although we do have folks who can advise us on that regard because everything was contingent on this board approving the contract anyway. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if everybody's got the same set of new defined rules, well, then they've got the new set of new defined rules under which to bid under. So there's been no favoritism portrayed that I know of. And I mean, that may just be my simple procurement background, but that's how I foresee that. So for me, should we rebid or should we proceed with what we have? I'm inclined to, to say we should rebid. And that's how I'll vote. Ms. Johnson? Can you explain why the why the end date is June 30th, 2025? Be, just because of the five-year extension that's part of this proposal. So you've got four years, four months, and then a five-year extension. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Collins, I guess. So, so, George, then, if we buy 450 next year, that's that's really six years worth of uh, paying for those 450. No, I think it's just four years. Well, so what's the four years and four months? Well, that's to get us to June 30th of the of this fiscal year end. So, in other words, we're going from uh, this month through the okay. end of 2016, and then four more years. To that, 2020 I, and then five years to 2020. I'm not, I'm not being disrespectful to you, but I'm just thinking of the hour. I, I know enough or I don't know enough that I can't vote for this. Okay. Um, Mr. Gillis, did you have a. Yeah, so I just. Uh, the way I always read our little summary sheets is if we have a term and an extension, then the monies that you're seeking would satisfy the obligation during the term and the extension. Correct. We so. But you've explained here that the $41 million is for the first four years, not for the almost 10 years. Correct. So why, usually the sheet delivers us a term and an extension and a total amount. So why is this different? Um, and what good would an extension be if you don't have any contracting I, authority? I think you're correct that in this case, uh, the five-year extension is not particularly relevant. Well, to, you don't have any, yeah. you, you wouldn't Except have any, that any if we, funding authority. Well, and we only, we, the, the funding authority only comes every year. So in this case, if in the fourth year, we, ex, you know, after three year after four years of leases, that fourth lease would go out into this extension period. That's the only reason that it's there. Right. So if there's no downside to the system buying off a one-year, uh, the first contract of the four-year lease, like Ms. Causey suggests, and having the curriculum committee review the performance, then what's the difference? Why would we want to have four years? So I'm, I'm with you. Good. All right. Can we well, make a note of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we have... Brother Gillis, can I call you that now? We have a, we have a motion. Um, now, again, Ms. Causey, would you please state your motion? Uh, that, go yes. ahead. 
Um, I move that we send this RFP back out to bid, that we also separate out the sound management system, since I've heard from many teachers that they do not want nor need four speakers in their small classrooms, and that we do it for a one-year contract. We have a second to that motion? Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Saris and Mr. Brown and Mr. Dixon. We appreciate oh, yeah. your patience. Thank you. <laughs> Our next item is uh, new business, a report on the Southwest Area Elementary School Boundary Study recommendation. And I could call forward um, Ms. Miller, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, and Mr. Cropper. He's here. Yes, I am still leasing and ownership. Good evening. Good evening, Chair McDaniels, Good evening. Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. We are Dr. Monique Whitley Phillip and Ms. Heidi Miller, co chairs of the Southwest Boundary Committee. The objective of the Southwest Boundary Area change was to reduce overcrowding in nine Southwest Area elementary schools. There are a number of construction projects on the way to ease overcrowding and to improve the facilities. In 2016, there were placement or additions underway for Catonsville, Westchester, and Westtown Elementary Schools. In 2017, a replacement school is scheduled for Relay and for Lansdowne Elementary. Plans for a replacement school have been added to the 2017 Capital Improvement Plan. <coughs> However, we recognize that the new construction does not address all the needs of the Southwest. Other regions in the Southwest will need to be targeted for future capacity relief efforts. Guided by policy and rule 1280, which states that the superintendent will initiate a boundary process for three reasons. For construction of a new school, or addition to an existing school following funding approval by the state and or county. Second, when school closures or consolidations are deemed appropriate by the superintendent. And third, to balance enrollment between schools under or over the state rated capacity. There are four phases to the planning process beginning in April through August of 2015. Phase one began with the superintendent's decision to initiate the process. Phase two was the orientation process for principals and communication to the community. Phase three was the preparation of data and information, and phase four was the convening of the committee. The work of the Boundary Committee began in September 2015 and concluded in December 2015. The Board of Ed decision is planned for March 1st, 2016. The new boundary implementation will then occur from March through August of 2016. We would now like to introduce Matt Cropper, GIS Consulting, who will walk us through the boundary study process and present the recommended option. Thank you. So schools who are represented in the boundary study uh, were defined as schools that either are undergoing a, a capital improvement project or schools that were adjacent to, to those that are undergoing some improvements, which are added capacity as a result of new construction or additions. Uh, there were 11 total schools identified in the study area of those that could be affected as a, as a result of this process. The committee was provided with information as it relates to uh, uh, Rule 1280, and they really followed these, these guiding principles as they were looking at uh, evaluating the feasibility of moving boundary lines one way or the other. Uh, some of the things that were really pertinent in this area were uh, uh, using a vi uh, efficient use of space, so balancing building utilization, um, using natural roads and, and natural um, geographic features, man-made geographic features, and then uh, looking at diversity and the impacts on diversity with the various plans, to name a few. 
this area, the, the, the local area committee also felt that it was important to focus on some, uh, some additional factors, such as maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods and uh, the impact of transportation and walkability. Uh, walkability in the Catonsville this area, or the southwest area of this, uh, this study area, was a high priority, and, and there was a lot of discussion around walkability um, and the impacts on walkability. The Boundary Study Committee was comprised of 45 total members. Uh, there were 11 principals that sat on the committee, and the principals were provi provided input throughout the process, but they were non-voting members, so they were not allowed to vote on the final uh, plans as they, were, um, as they were finalizing their recommendation. There were 33 teachers and parents uh, on the committee, and those teachers and parents were, were, uh, were sought out by principals um, who know the community and to, to get active um, participants to serve on, the, on this committee. In addition to the 33 teachers and parents, there was the chair of the Southwest Advisory Council who sat on the committee. And the committee was supported by the assistant superintendents, uh, the school administrators, and also myself and our staff at Crawford GIS Consulting. <clears throat> the boundary study met seven times through the course of the study uh, from September through December. So they really put a lot of hours into meeting time and then also did a lot of time studying the, the information and the data in between meetings. Um, they, at the beginning of the process, they looked at the building blocks of redistricting, so they evaluated the, what we call planning blocks, which are small planning units, and they evaluated those and gave feedback to make adjustments to those. Um, and then they really looked through multiple scenarios through the course of the study uh, to evaluate which ones were best, best met the needs of the area and the objectives and the criteria. Um, all of the materials that were presented to the committee were, were made available online. So all of the materials that were handed out to them, the, usually the next day, were, were made available online so the public could print off the copies or, or reference the materials and uh, everything that was being shared with the committee uh, at the meetings. The public was very engaged in the process. We had, uh, I would say, anywhere from 60 to 100 observers at every single meeting. Um, and it was very important to have them there. Um, they were there as observers at the committee meetings, but in between meetings, they provided a lot of good information and input for the committee's benefit as a, uh, in, in the form of emails. And then also, there was a general comment form on the website that we were receiving lots of good input from the, from the committee or from the public. And we shared that information to the committee uh, at various times. The meetings were also streamed live uh, on live stream, and, uh, and the copies of those live stream videos were also made available on the website so people could go back and look at the video and, um, at a later time. Um, as I said, everything was made available online. Um, in addition to giving the public the opportunity to provide input through the, through the process, uh, the committee invited the public to a public information session where uh, the committee had narrowed down to about four options at that time. And they um, invited the public to come out, look at the maps, uh, learn about the process, and then talk with the committee members and the and, and staff around the maps and discuss some of their concerns. Um, there was an online survey that was made available uh, for as uh, for that community information session, and we received about 1,200 res, uh, responses to that online survey. In addition to the emails and the other other information, so there was a lot of good feedback provided throughout the course of this process. As I said, the committee really spent a lot of time and evaluated um, um, multiple scenarios. There were 23 total scenarios that were evaluated through the course of this study. So at the beginning point of the process, the committee is looking at how many scenarios can they develop to, to accomplish the objectives and criteria. And then once they feel like they have a good number of scenarios on the table, then they started the process of, of, of elimination and, and selecting scenarios that they felt best met the criteria and objectives. Um, the committee recognized that there was no single scenario that was going that may address capacity pressures in the southwest area. Um, and they also recognized that no single scenario will satisfy the guiding principles equally. And what I tell committees, this, this committee and committees uh, across the country are, 
when you look at the criteria, the best plan is one that touches on the criteria, on, on different components of the criteria, but doesn't focus solely on one of the criteria. If you start to focus only on one piece of the criteria, you deviate from, from the others. And so the best plan is one that, that touches on the criteria as a whole, but doesn't focus solely on, on one element of the criteria. So uh, as I said, when the committee was working through those 23 scenarios, they narrowed it down to four options to take to the public at that public information session, as I mentioned. The committee then, uh, once uh, near the end of the process, formulated a recommendation. Um, I really uh, commend their, their hard work and uh, the amount of time and effort and their commitment to the school district. Um, they really did a great job in this, in this process. Um, they, there was an additional meeting in September and uh, December that was scheduled so that the committee could fully deliberate on their recommendation and finalize their recommendation. Um, when it got down to the, to the end, there were three scenarios, uh, final options that were considered that were variants of options that were presented to the public. They heard the public's feedback and they continued to make adjustments um, that made the, the, the options better in terms of the criteria and the, and the objectives. And those were options 3.2A revised, 3.2B revised, and 3.3. So um, I'll show thus the current boundaries where you could see just with, b before any adjustments were made um, are on the screen. And then option 3.2A revised was the first option of the final three that were considered. 3.2A uh, revised affects six, affected six total schools, a total of 378 K through five students. Option 3.2B revised uh, affected the same number of schools. Six total schools were affected, but uh, 346 total students were affected in option 3.2B revised. Option 3.3 affected more schools. It affected nine total schools within the study area, nine out of the 11, and 708 total K through fifth, fifth grade students were affected if option three were to uh, move forward. So the committee uh, voted to uh, recommend option 3.2B, uh, re the revised 3.2B. Um, again, they, they really looked at, we gave them time to study all the body of work that they've been working through and studying over the course of the whole study, study period and uh, to, to formulate and finalize their recommendation. The tally at the last meeting, the December 16th, uh, 2015 meeting were uh, 16 total votes in favor of option 3.2B revised. 3.3 uh, re received six total votes, and 3.2A revised received two <coughs> votes. So there was a clear, um, a clear winner in the case of uh, the recommendation. The recommendation does balance enrollment among schools, uh, among most of the schools, but it does not completely resolve the uh, capacity pressures in the region. Schools that were affected include Arbutus, Catonsville, Halethorpe, Hillcrest, Relay, and Westchester, and schools on the northern and southernmost areas of the study area were, were not impacted as a result of the recommendation. Those include Edmondson Heights, Johnny Cake, Lansdowne, West Town, and Woodbridge. So we have the, the, current, the current boundaries again for comparison, and then the recommendation. Uh, which is, uh, was 3.2B uh, revised is the recommendation that this committee is bringing forward uh, to, the, to the board at this time. In addition to the maps, uh, there are some statistics in this presentation, and these are the statistics that the committee was working with throughout the course of the study. But you can see the, uh, the current enrollment of the schools and the current utilization of the schools as it relates uh, and compare that to the recommendation. And you can see that the schools that, um, that are highlighted on the table in, um, in blue are the ones that, that, that were impacted. And you could see that the resulting utilization does, um, does provide relief to those schools. <clears throat> 
In addition to enrollment and utilization stats, the committee was looking at the impacts on demographics and uh, number of students that were impacted total. And uh, so this, this table just shows you the before and after um, of the uh, percent minority and free and reduced price lunch student uh, percentages, uh, before being the current school boundaries and after being the, the recommendation. And again, the total number of students that were impacted as a result of this recommendation are 346 total K through fifth grade students. Regarding implementation of this boundary change, we noted at the start of this presentation that the boundary change process follows the addition of capacity that will be provided over the next two years through construction projects we listed. You will recall that three projects will be completed in August of 2016 and one relay will be completed in August of 2017. The committee recognized and supported that this would be a phased implementation due to the timing of the completion of the construction projects. Our goal, which was supported by the Boundary Study Committee, is to move students when seats are available and not move students to already overcrowded schools that will ultimately get relief when new seats are ready. Therefore, we project about half of the students that might be impacted would move for next school year and half would move for the start of the 2017-2018 school year. All students whose homes will be the newly zoned Catonsville, Hailthorpe, and Westchester will attend those schools in August of 2016. All students whose homes will be the newly zoned Relay and Arbutus will attend those schools in August of 2017. There are exceptions to this. Students attending a magnet program, the magnet program procedures and rules continue to apply, and students going into fourth and fifth grade and siblings currently enrolled in the year the boundary goes into effect who may apply and be granted a special permission transfer according to Rule 5140. So in conclusion, please refer to the following upcoming dates. The Board of Education public hearing is scheduled for February 17th at 7 p.m at the Catonsville High School Auditorium. Snow date is February 18th. The recommendation for approval will move forward at the March 1st Board of Ed meeting. We will now open the floor for questions. All right, are there board members that have questions for our panel tonight? Um, Mr. Yulfelder? Um, not in the form of a question. I just wanted to uh, compliment uh, the work that was done. This is my fourth boundary change and since I've been on the board and what was most important to me that it was is that the process has been carefully followed not only our policy but the input from the public and um, it appears to me that, that this was probably the most complete process that we've had in any of the previous uh, boundary changes um, I myself uh, have no recommendation uh, to change what the um, committee has decided is to be in the best alternative. We've re we've we're inundated at times uh, with uh, emails, um, mostly negative. But my experience has been that uh, those uh, people who are against any change, and usually uh, every parent is parochial about their school and their child. Uh, they, they, they do the writing. The ones who are satisfied, you never really hear from. So I, I'm, I'm very satisfied with the outcome. Again, as long as the process was done democratically and in accordance with all our rules, regulations, and everything else. Um, so I, I don't see any reason why, uh, as a board, um, we should try and change anything uh, with that has been recommended, even though we've got several or a lot of negatives from some parents in some particular uh, locations within the, the total area. Thank you. Um, I did have a question um, comparing um, option 3.3 to the uh, current one that's being recommended. It seems that that 3.3 gives more relief to Johnny Cake elementary school, I believe. And I was just wondering if the, there were some participants on the committee that didn't vote in the end, but did the uh, participants that were rec re representing Johnny Cake, did they actually vote in the process? Um, or how would you, could you characterize the folks that voted for 3.3? 3 
Um, well, I know that each school had one voting member uh, present, and five, um, five of the eight not that, that didn't um, not voting were members whose school was not affected. Okay. So there were people there, uh, members from all schools at the final day when the votes were cast, and there was a lot of debate about about that issue, uh, providing relief or less or more relief to the various schools. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Quasi? Um, I just wanted to say um, that I was uh, fortunate to be able to attend one of the community meetings with Nick, and it was, um, to echo David, a very, very smooth process. And um, I know there was a lot of um, um, heated conversation at times, but you particularly um, handled it uh, very well, and I did think that the uh, folks had an opportunity to look at all the maps, to make some adjustments. Um, so I think it was a really great process, and I want to commend uh, Mr. Stewart, because I know that he's been spending a lot of time with the community on this issue, and just now, us other board members are starting to also get some emails. But so I wanted to thank you for your efforts. Um, I would like not an answer now, but if you could email it to us. I am interested in uh, specifically what leeway the board might have to give um, grandfather in just one or two families. Some of the emails that um, we have received, it seems to be um, a couple families that are moving mid-grades, um, might have to move mid-grades, but the planning blocks, because I had the opportunity to be there, so I drove around the neighborhoods, um, it does seem that the, the planning blocks do seem to be in the right place in terms of walking the new walking um, walkers over to the new Catonsville Elementary School. But if there could be um, explanation given to the board members in an email um, of what leeway there is for the board to help individual families um, that may, you know, just be in transition a couple years with their little people um, to help them through, but not necessarily change the uh, the suggested plan. Mr. Stewart? Let me just add to that quickly, uh, and what the difference would be between a, a waiver, so to speak, after the lines are created, and a grandfathering, uh, and what the two different processes might look like to the extent that there are some material differences. Uh, but Kathleen, also, thank you for being so involved and making a big difference in this. And it's, it's easy to tell from the public uh, involvement how much of a difference that you all made and the kind of work that you put in, but it's also the behind the scenes, the hundreds and hundreds of emails and different conversations that you all were having. So thank you so much. I, the difference is immense. Yeah, again, I would echo the um, comments of board members. I did attend one of the sessions, and again, um, it was very uh, encouraging to see how well the public, the community was working together to get through this. So I'm, Really appreciate all your efforts there, um, Ms. Johnson. Question: um, I know the project was to relieve significant persistent um, elementary overcrowding, and when I notice Hillcrest is just on under one, um, conveniently, and then we've got Catonsville that will still be significantly under capacity, and we've got we've received a lot of emails as well um, about the plant this one particular planning block and those um, attending Catonsville. Can you just speak around the difference of uh, relief from Catonsville versus Hillcrest? Yes, the committee looked at a multitude of scenarios. Some scenarios um, they varied in terms of building utilizations when you compare when you look at the compare them together. Some did have more more uh, relief for Hillcrest and uh, and and a higher utilization for Catonsville. Um, and the, what the committee did was just they were focused on all of the criteria and weighing all of the different options and the criteria. And uh, the committee felt that it was best to recommend this scenario. They felt it was the best plan for the area. Um, it impacted fewer, the fewest number of students. Um, and it also addressed uh, some of the other concerns that the public was having and as it relates to the criteria. So I, I would say that they did look at a, a variety of scenarios that had different utilization rates. And the committee, this is the, the, the recommendation that the committee brought forward. They felt it best met the criteria and objectives. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? If not, uh, thank you very much. And um, I will note um, again, there's a public hearing scheduled for Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, the snow date is the next day at Catonsville High School. This will be an opportunity for the public to address the board on this matter. Sign up begins at 6 p.m. 
for those who would like to comment on the boundary. Members of the public may send their comments to the Board of Education or board members uh, directly. Um, the board will vote as was stated by Ms. Miller on uh, March 1st, 2016. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our uh, next agenda item is the one that was uh, adjusted at the beginning of the meeting, uh, new be business uh, action taken in closed session and we'll ask Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential employee matter in your uh, quasi-judicial capacity. This matter was considered on the record. There was no oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action taken by the board in closed session in the matter, which is uh, hearing examiner number 14-48. Do I have a motion then to approve uh, the action taken in closed session? So moved. moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nussbaum. And the order will be sitting on the desk for signatures. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next uh, item is board, uh, board comments. And I'll start with Mr. Stewart, since he's been away for a bit. We'll let him go first. You are so kind. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. I'll be very brief. Um, Dr. Dance, look forward to working with you uh, in the next few years to make positive changes uh, to our system and continue to serve our, our children and our community well. Uh, I wanted to just thank the members of the Lansdowne community for coming out in force tonight. Look forward to working with them to bring sustainable and, and needed changes to our school, which is uh, such a, a huge deal. Uh, but finally, I, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Bowler and Mr. Maniotis, although they may have uh, departed before this moment. Um, their difference has been impressive along the way, and each time I go one place, they've already been there 10 to 20 times before me. Uh, so I'm playing catch up and, and always will, but thank them. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Ms. Eaton, do you have any comments for us tonight? Sure. Okay. <laughs> In light of the late hour, I just want to say I'm still good. <laughs> <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. Ms. Kazi. <laughs> in light of the late hour, I will say good night. Thank you. Mr. Yulfalder. Uh, Mr. Gillis. Good night. Ms. Well, you had it. Uh, Mr. Collins. Nighty night. <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Congratulations, Dr. Dance. Thank you. Ms. Miller. I wanted to congratulate Dr. Dance on his renewal and uh, he knows that there will be some of us who will be keeping him on his toes over the next four years. I hope that the board can um, really address some things as we go into contract details and negotiations there. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. Birch. I'd like to welcome back uh, Mr. Yulfelter, who has been in Hawaii, so I would say <laughs> aloha. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh. Um, I would be ready. <laughs> and thanks for the candy. He ate it all. I'm the talkative one. And thanks I'd for just the candy. Like to, uh, mention out there for information uh, is revised Superintendent's Rule 1100 on community relations, revised Superintendent's Rule 6500 on instruction. And I'd like to mention that schools will be closed uh, in observance of President's Day on Monday, February 15th. And the next board meeting will be Tuesday, February 16th at 7 p.m. here at Greenwood. Uh, and then there's a public hearing on the uh, boundary, which we just mentioned. So if there are no other business, this meeting is now adjourned.